La Ciudad de Nueva York. It's the New York Hardcore Chronicles Live, episode 288. It's actually a lot more when you think about, uh, when you consider all the bonus stuff we did in the beginning during the pandemic. It's probably 300 shows already, but technically, let's call it, let's call it 288. How's everybody doing? I missed you. I'm happy to see you. I hope you and your loved ones are well. And I mean that. <laughs> Hi, Sally. Hi, Chris. Rich Zoller, it was good to see you yesterday. Yo, you know what? Yeah, I, 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 I'm going to play that clip from yesterday. Um, but, you know, real quick, you want to hear something crazy? Real quick, before we head down our path. The last show I did with my brother got, got flagged for copyright violation. And I'm like, what, what the fuck? Why would the show get, you know, I wouldn't. Mean, Turns out that the show is getting flagged. Probably this show just got flagged. This show just got flagged as well because the music that's in the intro and the outro is incendiary device divided state. And now that the record's coming out and the record label, um, whatever, UMG, so... I got flagged for copyright violation for my own song <laughs> twice, beginning in the end of the beginning of the end of the show. So I'm trying to sort that out with uh, with Bridge Nine Records, but go figure, right? F copyright violation for a song that I wrote, but you know that shouldn't surprise you, right? That's just that's that's how it goes. So I got I got to sort through that because now now retroactively they're flagging all my shows the last hundred shows where i use that where i use that as the uh intro i know right zero ironic 
my own song. You listen. I mean, that's not that bizarre. A lot of people don't don't own their publishing or their copyrights or or, or whatever. But you know, yeah, I use you know, it was all good. And then I guess since the record's uh, about to come out or whatever, shit goes down. Speaking of shit going down, live in the in the. What, let me guess, bro. Is that Washington Square Park? You are correct, sir. What's happening in Washington Square Park, man? Actually, Glenn Friedman just walked by. Oh, jeez. Did you say hello? <laughs> I I was going to, and then he was gone. Listen, before before yeah, he's a t Glenn Friedman's tough, man. Yeah, he you moves know? quick. He actually, it's funny because he actually gave a a big print to Walter. Walter walked in with a big cylinder. And said he just ran into Glenn and he gave him a big print. So, ah. but uh, I just came from uh, Generation Records, of course, with uh, with Walter and Quicksand celebrating uh, 30 years of Slip. Yeah, here's a shot. Cool. What, what what there's a new there's a new release of it, right? It, it's uh, they, they repack and there's a book and stuff, right? Well, there's a there's a, a special edition of the vinyl, and then there's an extra special edition with a hardcover book that's beautiful, really right. nice, and um, you know, and and it was a nice turnout, and he they spoke for, for quite a while, you know, and, and, and uh, who, who? Oh, here's another shot you sent me. Listen, we like we like Wally. He's he's a supporter of the show, and I've always been cool with him. You know, Wally's, yeah. a, Wally's a good dude. You know, he really is. He really is. A, he's a he's a, and he actually was uh, speaking very highly of your book while I was there. Is that right? Yes, he was. Yes, he was. He was one nope. of the people I was telling you about. Nobody says shit to my face. <laughs> you know. If, was, if somebody uh, has if somebody has a problem with me, they don't say it to my face. If somebody likes what I'm doing, they don't say it to my face. I I, I, I feel I all your in, calls. I live in an isolated world of of of, of self doubt and torture. <laughs> I'm I'm your I'm your middleman. Listen, man. So, but it know, was um. I saw. It in fact, so who who are all these people? Let me. I so I guess. What the, I, the record label, the book designer, his personal yeah. Assistant. I mean, I don't. I I have the list of names, but I couldn't tell you their, um, their their occupations uh, right off the top of my head. They were all connected, you know, connected through the band, and um, okay. you know, and it was really it was really a, a lot of fun. And uh, although you know, I gotta say, I'm used to I'm used to you moderating all of the events, and I was like, who's this guy? You know the other guy. So, uh, Reza, is he wearing a Casey Musgrove shirt? I think that's a Saad. Isn't that Sade? I think that is a know. Sade shirt. Yes, okay. yes, it is. And um, but I saw Lenny there. In fact, I I I did not get a chance to make it up to Dobbs Ferry yesterday. How was that? I have to ask. Yo, it was a pisser, and I got a little clip to show you from yesterday. This this is this is how it went down, and, and like. Yeah, so you know, I'll play the clip first, and then I'll give you the background. But but here here's the clip. That's awesome. I, I, is that a spawn mask he's wearing? Yeah, yeah. It's a, it's That's a spawn awesome. Mask. So, <laughs> so basically, this is the deal. If you want me, listen. If you want me to shoot your band, 
basically that's what you get. You get about 90 seconds, right? And then other than that, for the, your other 28 and a half minutes of your set, I will be standing out on the sidewalk bullshitting with my friends. But <laughs> if you want me to shoot your band, you got like 90 seconds. I come in, I do 90 seconds, and then I'm back out. And I listen to your – and listen – I like the mix. I like sidewalk. I'm a big fan of sidewalk mixes now. You know, like it was a good mix on the sidewalk. You know, I can dig you it. You know, the key is to write a 90 second song. That's it. You know, or be DRI and you can do three songs. You got me <laughs> you know? for 90. But it was, a, listen, I, I'm, I'm being silly. It was a lot of fun. Uh, we love New York hardcore comics. We, lo we love Debo and Lee. Uh, they were they were our first sponsors on the show. They're solid, um, and and I'm you know the, the community rallied. You know, um, looks like we're going to be playing up there. The Drew Stone Hit Squad. Nice. Um, we're going to do like an acoustic thing up there. So it's so it, it's all good, man. You know. That's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah. The uh, yeah. and it it's shout out Sunday, so I got to shout out my mom because oh yeah she uh she's in the hospital for a couple of days. Uh, this weekend uh, with a little bit of a diverticulitis thing, but she's feeling better, and uh, and now I'm feeling better. So good name, know. good name for a band. We might have to put it on the list. Diverticulitis. We're diverticulitis. <laughs> and and ironically, I went from the hospital of the diverticulitis to a night of coronary thrombosis. So really, it was a good. It was my, good all my around. My dad had my dad had diverticulitis. Di diverticulitis. Oh, he was in that band too. <laughs> <laughs> Yo, my dad. My dad's sustenance for years was camel with no filters, a stick of pepperoni, and a garlic a garlic bagel. That's all this guy ate for like a couple years, and then he's like, "Ah, my stomach." I'm like, "What, pop?" <laughs> the garlic bagel and the pepperoni sound great, though. <laughs> I got all no right. I got no beef with that. Seriously, so. man. All right, I'll talk to you soon. You got it. I'll hey. be right here in the park talking to the birds. All right. Be careful there. <laughs> All right. Take care. There you have it. It's going down. This is the New York Hardcore Chronicles Live, and we are sponsored by New York Hardcore Comics, The Organic Grill, the Texas Silver Rush, DTFM Vinyl Distro, Generation Records, 126 Hardcore Clothing, and Upstate Records. That said, put your shoes and socks on, kids. Let's bring our guest on. Let's make sure nobody's killing each other in the chat room. Yeah, right? Camel no filters, yo. For years, he would have a camel with no filter and a, a stick of pepperoni and a garlic bagel. It's all that that was all that was that's all this guy. That was his sustenance. That's it. Yes, that's right. Let me make sure nobody's getting killed. All right, everybody's good. That said. Let's bring our guest on the show. What do you know? Let's clear the deck. What the heck? I'm excited about this one. And I hope you are too. Today's guest is a British musician, vocalist, and guitarist hailing from Manchester, England. In his incredibly proficient career, he is known for his work with the bands The Destructors, The Desecrators, War Dance, The More I See, Prodigy, Janice Stark, Biogenesis, and English Dogs. Please welcome, coming at us from Peterborough, UK, Mr. Gizbutt. My man. How you doing? Good. How are you? <laughs> Great. Yeah, very good. That that list is just, yeah, you could go on and on. You know, after a while, you know, the, the sound of the names dropping is just going to get deafening. Yeah. <laughs> There's a How's few more you can add to the list, but, you know, it gets I, yeah. boring. I, I tried to cull the herd a little bit. You know, I, I tried to, you know. Take a few off. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. I, made, a I made a judgment call there. I hope I, hope I did. The, I hope I made the right call. You know? Well, you know, let me fill in a couple of bits because there's um, I played with uh, Steve Ignorance Last Supper, which was, you know, crass, yeah. basically, you know, playing we'll get all to the, that. Yep. the crass songs. And that was excellent. That's one of the highlights. And life. Scream, you were just playing with Scream. I'm currently, yeah, playing with Scream, which yeah. is another, another high life, high yeah. life, highlight. Well, well, let's take it. Let, let's let's kind of let, let's take it uh, from the beginning and let's let's bounce the ball back and forth. Okay. How did you come up? 
did you did you grow up in a musical household? How did music come into your life? Um, but yeah, it was all, always there. I mean, living in Manchester, I think that me and my friends were all into music. You know, uh, we just listened to it. You know, so we all went out and bought records. We all watched this program called Top of the Pops. Mm -hmm. um, it was just chart music. My brother, I had an, my eldest brother was really heavily into Hendrix and Pink Floyd. And then the younger brother was into Slade and Sweet. And, um, yeah. you, you know, just, let, let, let me just interject. That's one that comes up a lot on this show uh, it is Slade and Sweet. And he, here, he, here in the States, you know, they didn't really, it, it was, they didn't really have the presence, but S Slade yeah. comes up a lot with, with, you know. Yeah, well, I mean, the thing is, punk rock in the States, you know, began with MC5 and the Stooges. Sure. Uh, punk rock in the UK began with David Bowie, mm -hmm. Sweet, and the glam rock bands. Um they kind of uh, many of the very early punk bands started off as being you know they had a foot in glam rock you know uh, they were rather massive fans of it or they previously had a band that was a glam rock band and then it morphed into a punk band like jo like joe strummer w was in a, a pub yeah. band right the 101ers was that was that a pub band yeah band? well i mean steve jones i mean all of the sex pistols were all massive fans of david bowie you know so. sure sure uh, yeah, it played a huge part. And then, um, so, you know, I was buying records. You know, I was cycling to town and buying records. Um, my brother brought home a Beatles album, uh, which I took to straight away. That was Help. Mm. And I got really heavily into that and then kind of became a Beatles fan, sort of buying all the stuff like Revolver and Rubber Soul. Sure. And then that's when, because he was buying these, um, music papers um sounds enemy melody maker sure. and you know i was reading these they had some interesting features in i remember seeing like a great feature of the who and this was probably in something like 1975 you know great photograph of pete townsend throwing his guitar up in the air it was a long shot you know you could see this guitar was like something in the region of about 30 40 feet up in the air mm. Just things like those, that made the impression. Those, those, was that the those old high watt amps that he used to play? The old high watt amps with the yeah, less yeah. So You can imagine if yeah, you yeah. didn't have that right, that would have hurt. Yeah. But um, yes. Yeah, so then reading through these papers, I saw this band coming through the Sex Pistols, you know, and uh, it just intrigued me. Uh, so I, I think the, f the first thing was I was reading about it, and then living in Manchester. Um, we had a program called What's On on a Sunday evening, mm. and that had punk rock on it. So the Sex Pistols were on there playing when they were banned everywhere else. So they were actually on TV in Manchester when they were banned from the, the charts and banned sure. from playing. So um, I was just in the, the right time, the right place. So if you can imagine it, it's kind of like growing up with a brother that's into Hendrix, Leonard Skinner. And another one who's into Black Sabbath and Sweet and all this kind of stuff and glam rock. And then, you know, I kind of come in through the Beatles and then all of a sudden punk rock happens, you know. So it's always musical all the time. I, I have a quote. I have a, I have a quote, one of your quotes, and, and I want to read and I want to read it. And it's basically what we were just talking about here. And I quote, I started collecting Beatles records from when I was nine. So George Harrison would have been the first influence. But my brother Chris was a player and a massive heavy rock fan. There was always a guitar hanging around the house. Chris introduced me to the Leonard Skinner album, pronounced Leonard Skinner, and a Jimi Hendrix live at Woodstock bootleg he picked up, and I was gobsmacked. Yeah. I wanted to, I wanted to play like that. It's a tough decision to make, but Randy Rhodes may be my favorite all-time player. He certainly well, just, honestly, it really is a tough decision to make. There's so many great players. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, Hendrix, because my brother was such an in, uh, influence over me. Sure. So he would have, he had this flat in Manchester, which was super cool, you know, and like his friends would come around and I was in awe of all of these friends. They were all a bit hard rock, hippie-ish kind of people, sure. all long haired. And they'd come around and they were probably all smoking dope, you know, and, um, I was just like saying, oh, can I join the party? And, and Chris would say, no, you know, you've got to 
stay in this room and learn how to play this song. And when you've learned how to play it, I'll let you come into the party. And then he put on live at Woodstock, Red House by Jimi Hendrix. And it's like, you know, I'm, I'm 11 years old. I've only just picked up a guitar and you're expecting me to play that. Well, if you want to come into the party, you've got to learn how to play it. So I, 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 lo I love the sighting of pronounced Leonard Skinner. I, lo I, I loved that record growing up. It was yeah. that, that, that was almost like a that, honestly, I always felt like it was like that record was almost like a punk rock record. That, that first Leonard Skinner record was almost was like in, in spirit. It, 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 it had like a punk spirit, that record. Well, I just I remember at that time just thinking, is it possible for guitar playing to be any better than this? You know? Yeah, it's good because it was so right out. There. It was really advanced. And, yeah, um, yeah. Gary Gary Rossington, <laughs> Gary Ross, Gary Rossington, uh, Alan Collins, and <laughs> and then and Ed King. Yeah, Ed King is probably the got the edge. I think. Is that right? I think so. Well, he Ed King played that Strat. You know, he had that Strat sound, you know. Yeah, well, uh, he was um, working for the MCA. He does, like, two really great solos on that. Yeah. And yeah. I think that he came up with that main riff, too. So... Dun, 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 dun. <laughs> That's the one. Oh, hell yeah. I love I love that shit. Yeah. Um, yeah. So... so um, it, it, why guitar? Why why did you gravitate to guitar? What 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 made you pick up guitar? Like was there a aha moment or why why did you zero in on guitar? Actually, it was going to be bass first. Right. But the only reason why was just because you know, a nine years old and a big Beatles fan, and when you're that age, I think Paul McCartney is the one that kind of stands out the most. You you know, I think people like John Lennon stand out to you if you're a bit older. You know you kind of get that you know so i wanted to be the bass player but we went into our sort of cheap store which uh, in in the uk used to be woolworths yeah and um you know looking through the catalog in there trying to decide you know what do you want for your birthday i want a, a bass guitar well let's go down to woolworths and the bass guitar was 22 pounds, but the electric guitar was 19 pounds. So mm. my dad was like, no, no, we're going to get you this one and see how you get on with this. That's the that's the famous quote, you know, which I think all parents say, well, we'll see how you get on with this. You know what I mean? Sure. And the yeah, the first guitar that I, that I had was this K thing. A K, which, of course. Yeah. And <laughs> yeah. I think it was probably, you see them now, um, they're awful looking guitars and yeah. um, very cheap. One pickup in the middle, kind of like zigzaggy, um, not in a heavy metal way, but in a kind yeah, yeah. of just a weird kind of like retro 60s looking thing. And um, 19 pounds, I got that, got a tiny little five watt practice amp, which of course got turned up to the max and um, started oh. off with that. I'm, I'm looking. I'm trying to find a. I'm looking online to to find a picture of an old of an old K guitar. Yeah, I've seen them recently. You know, I've seen them on the um, Reverb. Although I can a absolutely guarantee you, this thing was a pig to play. You know, so <laughs> yeah. I wouldn't. You know, I wouldn't lose any sleep over it. But yeah, was, but it, was, was it was it was it a, a solid body? It was a solid body. Yeah. I mean, this is. I, I I know this is um, uh, this doesn't. Let me see what I got here. Yeah, yeah. This is teeny. The picture's teeny, but it, this is a. This is. Let me see if I can put this up. This is a. Um, You're finding something. Yeah, I found some. It's 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 a little. It's a small shot, but. Oh no, that's. Got that's got two pickups. That's way too cool. Yeah, that that's that's way that's. <laughs> in fact, that looks like a mod, right? So you know, if you were yeah. a Ramones fan, you'd be well in with that. Yeah. But um, so it, I had that for about three months, trying to learn how to play anything on it. Um, no <laughs> guitar teacher at first, just kind of right. putting my fingers down, playing bass lines. Really, you know. Right. Right. And then eventually, I think I, I tried to form chords, but I, I knew what the notes were inside chords because I knew them by ear. Right. But, but I didn't know how to play a chord. So, sure. like, for instance, you know, I had no sense to play an A like that, you know. So I was playing an A like this. 
really weird kind of doing it upside down. Mm. And then eventually someone gave me a, a chord book and I thought, oh, right. Now, and it took me a while to figure it out. First finger, second, third, and then I'm forming an A chord. And then, and then, one, and then once you're there with G, A, and D, yeah, the, well, world, the whole world opens up. My brother was there to show me a few chords and he's looking at me and that he, he can play bar chords. So I'm looking at this bar chord thing. And I'm thinking, wow, you know, what's that big thing going up and down the neck? You know, it's, <laughs> and um, he was really, he was able to play stuff like jumping Jack flash and things. So I was right. just watching this in awe, but yeah, once I got three chords, you know, I could play Eddie Cochran. So I could play like a bunch of rock and roll songs, Eddie Cochran, Buddy Holly, um i think they were like the first things that i was actually you know like peace summer together. summertime blues and yeah come on everybody oh yeah uh, it's something else um that will be the day somebody they were probably just, the first somebody just sent this to me i think this is more like it right this That's is okay yeah that is, that is the one yeah thank you paul, paul stone just paul stone just sent that to yeah me. you uh, see it's yeah. got that strange kind of pointy horn right and, and I think the guitar is kind of like a three quarters. It was pretty small. It wasn't small for me then because I was 11, but you know. And, 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 the, and the action, the action on it, it's about this, the strings are about this far off the fretboard. Yeah, well, that's the, that's the thing you see when you're kind of like in this world on your own, because none of my, my brother played the guitar, but he didn't actually own the only guitar he had around the house really at that time was an acoustic right. and, our, and that had high action he did have electrics but they'd all come and gone you know the house was a little bit like that you'd see an electric guitar then you see a different one then you see an, another different one then you see none then you see an acoustic guitar my brother was a little bit like that he's probably selling it all the time you know um michael roche asks Giz, what was your first real guitar? What what was what was the first one you picked up that was like a, a real cherished instrument? Okay, well, so I was then receiving guitars for birthdays and Christmas okay. time, you know, for gifts. You know, mm -hmm. um, I didn't have a job at that time. I didn't work in a coal mine or anything like that. You know, I wasn't an electrician. I was eleven years old, so. Um, it came to Christmas and then I got a Columbus Les Paul, which kind of, you know, nowadays it's quite a tasty little thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then shortly after that, um, I had an Astoria SG. Both of these guitars were OK. But the first one that came along and had, you know, like decent action and, you know, probably had the edge with the sound was this Ibanez thing. Mm. And Ibanez... SD a studio 55 so it had mm. two pickups it looked a bit like an SG right um and it had like decent action so yeah and and and, and they stayed in tune a little bit a little bit a little bit, a little bit. <laughs> they stayed in tune okay they weren't bad they could have done with better pickups but there you go yeah yeah, yeah. did did you take um did you take lessons uh, as an 11 year old did, did you ever go to any sort of formal like or, did, or was it all just out of the book and, and and word of mouth so to speak no my my dad made me go for lessons as soon as i got that um columbus les paul right he took uh, took me for lessons um do as a jazz guitarist in manchester right. and um this guy was pretty strict so i would walk in there what can you play you know so i'm playing you know eddie cochran and he goes right you're not doing any of that <laughs> and and he was kind of like rather than just teaching me songs he would he'd teach me like some strange kind of songs but he was teaching me how to construct chords and how mm. to um he was teaching me more kind of like the strangest side of things you know like um like diminished chords augmented chords but the most important thing that he taught me was how to construct chords. He hmm. taught me a major scale. He taught me a diminished scale. And um, because of that, that bit of knowledge, I'm, I'm able to, I don't need to learn every chord. You know, right. if, I, if, if someone showed me a chord, I can kind of like figure it out because right. you know, I have the process of constructing them inside my head, you know, so, right. you know, and he taught me that. Of course, there's a name for every single chord, and eventually I'll find the name for it. But right. um, I don't need to learn every single one. 
so something so something can be said for as as a young aspiring guitarist or, or musician in general just getting any sort of semblance of structure fr from a teacher is, is probably uh, i i think a, a, a somewhat valuable tool you know? yeah and also the other thing is 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 that having lessons having lessons with this chap opened up my brain to um to a whole new world so you know, and that once that's opened up, I can hear new things that I couldn't necessarily hear before, or maybe I could, but now I can actually put a name to it. Yeah. But also, it helps me. You know, I I could I could be listening to blues based music all my life, or I could kind of expand on that and listen to stuff that's got more notes. You know, I'm not knocking any of the blues based stuff, but sure. it, it's like as soon as you can start to hear these kind of chromatic notes. Yeah. So. When I'm speaking chromatic, I, what I'm trying to say is, you know, rather than blues based, which is, you know, like this kind of, you know, like that kind of pattern of notes, five notes. Yep. Rather than blues based, you know, you could be dealing with something that's got like seven notes. Okay, so when when you've got seven, then it just adds a little extra to your vocabulary. You know, so you can start to just have like, it's not just all E and G, you know, you can actually have like a C in there or a, a D with an F sharp. I know it's just kind of, it just brings a bit of color to everything. Absolutely. Then when you've got chromatic in there, then you can start to think there's a possibility of, you know, that kind of thing. This, these patterns of notes now, you, you know, like for instance, like Bad Brains, we're all fans of Bad Brains on here. Sure. So, you know, you remember the Bad Brains song, was it uh, at the movies? <laughs> there's a test and a test and a thing. Well, what could it be? On the big white screen. When I first heard that, you know, I thought, that's it. You know, that's where I'm kind of coming from. You know, um, I could relate to that track straight away. I mean, my yeah, guitar yeah. teacher, I guess he was trying to teach me how to play Stairway to Heaven. It's kind of a similar thing. Yeah. You know, it's yeah. chromatic notes. And when you listen, sometimes you'll get a songwriter and they'll put in this element, the word chromatic. Um, or maybe they'll just put something in that's kind of colourful you know not just blues based but believe me i'm not knocking blues based stuff sure so you you your family moved from manchester to peterborough in in around seven around 78 and that's yeah. when you you formed your first band it was northern lights <laughs> yeah right well we was at school and um the school, <laughs> the school was divided into houses do you do something similar to that over there in the States? You know, like when you, you're at school, there's like a, you might have, I don't know, you might name the houses after planets or something like that. You know, mm -hmm. Venus, Neptune, Uranus, of course. Yeah. But um, no, in our case, we, had, we we just had four houses. So North, South, East, West. Sure. You know, I was in North House. So, you know, it was coming up to Christmas, school concert. And it was like, you know, let's form a band and play a couple of songs for the school concert. What are you going to call yourself? You know, well, we're in North House, so the Northern Lights, you know. I've heard worse. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I've hey, heard uh, worse well. hey, our friend, uh, our friend uh, Skeeter says hi. <laughs> Skeeter. There you go. Big up, Twenty. Ah, yeah. How you doing? And, and and Mary says hello as well. We miss oh, you. Oh, Mary. Thank you yeah. for the socks, Mary. I've had them on. I wore them yesterday. That was great thank you lovely warm socks thank you yeah um so how, so i guess you were what 14 15 when you started this uh this musical 12 12? 12 good yeah. lord man yeah and we played um in the assembly we played rat trap by the boomtown rats <laughs> yeah okay yeah enoch yeah um don't forget the, hmm? it's enoch i know Okay, yep. gotta yep. remember that. Yeah, yeah. Um, the so did you guys? Hey, what is this? Is this? I, I, I'm not sure, but is this a shot of a young, a young Giz? It's not that young. Okay, um, I, all right. Because I, 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 I thought this was one of the earlier photos that I, that I came across. 
Well, I was probably about 24 or something like that at that time. Okay. My, my son looks just like that. Yeah. Well, that's how, that's how it goes, right? That's how he goes. Yeah. So, so uh, Northern Lights morphed into the system. Is that right? Northern Lights was just a bunch of lads from the, the class. Okay. And, you know, um, we were playing for the school, school concert. And it, that was that was you know as I said you know we played Rat Trap which I thought was pretty pretty cool you know it's a kind of you know new wave song for you know for the era but then after that it was like come on let's let's go to the next step let's actually kind of practice a set of songs and um, let's give it a different name so we actually we were called the Exits mm. yeah so. Which I- <laughs> It's not a bad name for a 12-year-old band, you know. Well, it's like, you know, it's one of those names that's, you're probably the 300th band called The Exits. We're the new, we're the new Exits. You know, we're, we're the real Exits. You know, we're, we're the Exits, you know, 1978. There's so the many bands that have shared the same damn name. I mean, you know, sure. uh, the system as well. I mean, there was more than one right. system, wasn't there? So... But at least with that band, I kind of got together a set of songs and we started writing our own songs. So that's the most important part. And we right. started to bring our own songs and we were playing them in front of our schoolmates. Now, try and bear in mind that this time was pretty cool because punk rock and new wave was the thing. It was on the radio. It was on top of the box, the old program that was telling you about. And it was all over the music papers and there was magazines coming out. A lot of people liked it. But at the same time, of course, there was disco. So disco and punk rock were, I don't know, if you didn't like one, you liked the other. And um, so we were playing in front of the school and playing this kind of stuff, and it was going down pretty good. You know, everyone could relate to it at that time. And so we would write our own songs, and they would go down well you know too and then we actually had people saying oh i really like that song of yours and do it again you know was it was it a was it a um in uh, in lack of a better term easy process to start because you know you know right writing original music is not for everyone as we all know Mm. some people struggle greatly with it Uh, is it something that you took too early on is it something that came naturally it's something that you develop, you know, you, uh, you write a few songs and they're not very good. You keep mm. on, you kind of readdress them and then sure. you might kind of polish them up a little bit and um, just keep writing. It's, it's a process of like readdressing, trying again. Maybe that one's not so good, but don't sure. necessarily, don't necessarily bin it. Don't throw it in the bin. Yeah. Um, I'm a, I'm all for that. You know, I, I always believe, you don't need to throw anything away just Mm. kind of you know either just record it and keep it as it is you know you you did that when you was 12 13 you know or rework it sometimes when you rework something you keep on going back time and time again rework rework give it a little polish a little brush up Mm. just try that and that and then you end up having a classic by the end of it you know Fantastic. Let's yeah. talk a little bit about the Destructors. Uh, how did it come together? I know, I know, you, uh, the band, you know, had a nice run from about 1981 to 83, a, a bunch of LPs, seven inches. How did it come together? And 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 just uh, explain how that played out. Okay, so I was I was with this band called the System, mm-hmm. and uh, the System was um, that was quite a, a good band. You know, we had. Um, we had, we had a good set of songs going. We used to practice every possible break time, lunch time, after school. In the lessons that we didn't like, we'd bunk off and we'd go and into the rehearsal room in the in the school and we'd practice. We were practicing, practice, practice, practice. We had a full set of original songs. We were very influenced by the UK subs, Pistols, Crass. Mm. And we'd come up with like... A, you know, a full 40 minutes worth of original material, but also a bunch of covers in there, you know, lots of UK subs, all that stuff, yeah, UK yeah. subs, pistols. And um, so we we began to sort of go out and do gigs, you know, in the local community centres, but we were hanging around with a band that was like our best friends called the Zena Diodes. Mm-hmm. They, were, they were older than us. They were three years older than us. So, you know, I was like 13, 14. They wow. were... 
16, 17. And we'd hang out with each other and, you know, we'd play with each other and we'd get the gigs in the community centres. They'd be playing with us. Then the lead guy of that band, Dave Allen, uh, he, he's made the, the grand move of booking us to play in a pub, in a bar, you know, which, of course, you know, really exciting because, you know, we, we went out and saw the Destructors playing. Before I joined them, the Destructors were going I think. Um, as a four-piece. And I'd go and see them because previously to the Destructors, they were known as the Blanks. And they mm. had this song called The Northern Ripper, um, which was released on seven-inch singles. So, you know, if you've got a seven-inch single out for her, you must be a star. Do you know what I mean? And um, so... But we used to go to a local place called the Marina Stadium and we'd watch bands, you know, UK subs, Angelic Cup starts the damned. You know, we'd see all these bands playing there and they were supporting. I'm trying to remember which band they were supporting. I think it was Buzzcocks. Mm. Anyway, so they would support. This is the Blanks, right? So we, we knew of them. Then the next thing we hear, oh, have you heard the Blanks have split up and now they're called the Destructors? I said, like, okay, let's check them out. And then the Destructors are playing you know, at this venue, this pub, and, you know, 14 years old, my friend Dave Allen says, let's go and see them. So we and, went and let me just ask, at, at, at 14 years old in the UK, you could go, in, you could go into the pub, but no problem, huh? No, but I mean, you know, when I was 13, I kind of shot up a little bit. I was, <laughs> right. I was pretty much six foot when I was 13. Okay. And, um, but I've been reading all this. I remember reading these great interviews by, Paul McCartney, you know, and he was saying that when he was really young, they went to go and see, um, oh, I'm trying to remember the name of the film. It was one of these um, like rock and roll films that came out in the like mid 50s. Hail, hail rock and roll. Billboard Jungle or something like that. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Blackboard Jungle? Something like that. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. It. Blackboard Jungle. I think so. Let me look it up. Go ahead. Something like that. Look it up. But, um, and he said in the interview, he said, you know, they were very young. They were only teenage, very young teenagers. So they rubbed dirt underneath their nose to, to <laughs> form a mustache line. That's so great. when when Rock and Roll Swindle came out, that's exactly what I did because I was 13 and I went to the, see it at the cinema and it was an X certificate, you know. So you're supposed to be 18, but I'm 13. So what am I going to do? You know, well, put on a leather jacket, pair of Dr. Martin boots, rub some filth underneath your <laughs> nose and pretend that you're 18 you know it's kind of well you know we got away with it so yeah. then from the age of 14 we started having that attitude of you know let's try going to the pubs yeah so we did you know we went to the pubs and we were drinking beer when we were 14 you know yeah that, that, getting that, away that. with it when you put on a, a leather jacket and you have a pair of tight jeans or a pair of bondage trousers which is what i used to wear Sure. You know, most, most people can't believe you can't be 14 and wear bondage trousers, you know, mm -hmm. you yeah. must be 18. So, yeah. um, yeah, got away with it. So he booked this venue and, um, yeah, we were playing, we were in the pubs and that was a great gig. And then Alan Adams of the Destructors was there. Mm -hmm. So the main man of the Destructors was at that gig watching us. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the gig, he came up and said, do you want to join the band? You know, so how quickly could I say yes? You know, right. It was, you, you it was like, yeah. I think I said yes before he even said, duh, you know, it just like, <laughs> you, you, you were marrying yeah. up, so yeah. to speak, right. You were marrying up, so to speak. You know, well, it's, it's, it was an obvious thing to do. Yeah. Um, and so the destructors had, um, a nice run. Um, one of one of the things I wanted to ask you about was um, how did we put this up here? I see I see our friend Pusshead um, did did a lot of the art, uh, some of the art. Um, how did he yeah. come into play? Um, him and Alan were in contact with each, with each other. Um, you know, you got to remember that Pusshead wasn't always Pusshead Schroeder. He wasn't always the big art god that he is you know he of started course. somewhere like we all do you know that's right he was doing these amazing posters and um he was sending them to alan and then alan was using them for our gig posters 
Right. Uh, this uh, this is this is a great. This I, is really nice, man. I've got that somewhere on my body. Um, where is it now? Is it is it there? Oh, hold on. Let's see. It's somewhere on me. <laughs> I've just got to remember where it is. What side oh, is there, it? There it is. Oh, there you go. Nice. There we go. Yeah. So yeah, I've got it on my body. Very proud of that. Yeah. Um, this. I'm looking for the. I know there's a destructors flyer that I saw. Hold on. Where, do I, where is that? Um, you know, you mentioned. You mentioned this guy, and you know, I think I'm just. Gonna, I think I'm just going to throw this card on the table. Uh, I love this shot. Uh, could you could you give us some perspective on on this gentleman and and oh, kind of yeah, please. So um, the UK subs, you know, they released like a a, a, a series of singles um, going from 1978. The first one was CID, and I remember hearing about that first one when it came out, and then I, I bought it. You know, it me and my friends were all sharing tips. You know, this new band UK subs, and then. Um, after CID, which was a great song, you know, um, such a good riff, just a great song. Um, after that, they brought out a single, Stranglehold, which was on that program, Top of the Pops. They were one of those bands, punk bands, that managed to regularly get on Top of the Pops, which was great for them and great for us because, you know, it meant that we could see them. So, and you got to bear in mind that I was that age where I'm not fully clued up on jumping on a train and going to London to watch a gig. You know, I I did go to London a few times, but um, mainly, you know, once I joined the Destructors, maybe a little bit just before, there were coach trips going on in Peterborough and we'd go and see bands play. Um, but, you know, let's bear in mind that these singles came out when I was even younger than that, you know, when I was like 12 and 13. And uh, so they had... CID, Stranglehold, and then Tomorrow's Girls. And Tomorrow's Girls is just a hit. It's just a blatant hit. It's it got to go down with one of the greatest songs of all time. And Charlie Harper, you know, wrote, co-wrote those songs and, you know, sung them and still does to this day. And he's a great man. He's mm. If you was going to say to me, name three people that you'd like to have as dinner guests, you know, Charlie's up there, you know, he's, yeah. He, he, I can talk to him for days. I, I kind of regard him as being my surrogate father in some ways, you know, cause he's just such a great, he's like a father figure, you know, he's a, such a great man and he's a gentleman, you know? Yeah. yeah I've, I've, I've met him once or twice. I've, I've never heard a bad word about Charlie Harper. You no, know? you struggle, you struggle to hear. I mean, I, I did actually for us, for us, period of time three months i was actually kind of like a member or just about to be a member of the uk subs so um we've got some history did this is this is a pus head flyer um yeah. and is this it's english dogs and destructors mm. how, how did this how did how did this how did this play out I've got that flyer, by the way. I've got mm. that one. I've got all the old flyers. Managed wow. to keep all of them. Yeah, I managed to That's keep them. But um, well, the dish, the English dogs, they come from Grantham, which is like forty miles north mm -hmm. of where I live, and uh, they played their second ever gig supporting the Destructors, and you know we formed a bond with them, and so they played with us all over the place. I see. Mm. So, so English, the English dogs existed um, in, some, in some form before you joined. Yeah, sure. Yeah, of course. Yeah, the the, the lineup with Wakey and uh, John Murray, Watty. Yeah, absolutely. Got it. Yeah. Um, so I joined them in in uh, eighty four. So they'd already been going for two years before that. Got it. Got it. Um, Tell us about how you joined. Uh, uh, you know, highlights. I know you came to America at a certain point. Could could you 
you know, give us some. Well, the, thing, the thing is with um, English dogs is during that period, by the time, you know, coming towards the end of the destructors, um, I guess I was just realizing more of my guitar playing stuff, you know. So what was initially, you know, just playing Hendrix licks started to grow you know yeah i mean i was learning all the punk stuff that i liked of course i was uh, especially a fan of the damned mm. and, and the roots yeah, and i really dug those two bands and i just thought their playing was great captain sensible such a good guitarist and um i was just like learning all that stuff and copying it and i wanted to sort of get my fingers underneath a, a you know a bunch of those leads and um captain sensible was playing like a great style of lead and mm. I'm, so that's where i wanted to go so i just started to sort of like you know get my fingers a little bit more flexible and mm -hmm. uh, and just learn a few more tricks but of course in doing that eventually someone is going to say have you checked out this and then you hear you know a heavy metal band sure. and um i mean motorhead were pretty close to being a punk band anyway so i mean sure. you know if you learn the damned you know, you're going to learn Bomber and Ace of Spades. Yeah. Uh, you know, you're going to learn that. But then eventually someone is going to turn around and say, well, have you checked this out? And, right. you know, that could be, you know, anything. I guess it could be, you know, obviously Thin Lizzy. Obviously Thin Lizzy was... Scott, Scott Gorman. Uh, Scott Gorman, all of them. Brian Robertson, Brian Gary Robertson. Neal, all, all of them. You know, yeah. some great guitarists in, in Thin Lizzy and... and uh, you know, we were exposed to that. In fact, I'd even go as far as to say that Thin Lizzy were the heavy metal band that punk bands liked. Sure. But then eventually, you know, you'd hear ACDC and you think, wow, you know, check out Angus Young and you'd hear. So eventually you'd go down that route because people were saying, wow, I'm really, you know, your guitar playing. I'm going to dig that. Have you heard mm. this? Van Halen. Yeah. You know, and then, then you'd hear something, it'd blow your socks off. And I would, I was kind of, always keen on trying to figure out what someone else was doing so that was going on and then the english dogs they were going through a period of kind of similar to what i was going through they were digging some you know heavy metal stuff i was getting into it i was beginning to write in that way <clears throat> influenced metal influenced riffing yeah. and you know metal influenced solos and you know, it was no bad thing. You know, it's just basically, you know, it's just development. It's just, it's just expansion. That's all it is. Mm -hmm. And and I, I I was I, I'm I'm a I'm a great fan of, of your lead work. And and you know, doing my homework for the show, uh, really really enjoyed uh, um, listening to your catalog and, and all the stuff you've done. And I, and I was thinking, you know, and, and you just answered it. You know, you know, who influenced him as a lead player? You know, was, was there anybody from and, and you pretty much answered it from the same sort of genre? I mean, not not going, but, but like any of your peers in that any of any any of your peers really impressed you or, or, it was, or it was you? mainly like, as I said, um, Captain Sensible. Sensible. Yeah. The vibrators had some pretty cool lead stuff going on. Yeah. Hugh Cornwall of the Stranglers, he could rattle out a decent yeah. lead. I mean, I always liked Steve Jones. I just liked his style. I just yeah. I just really enjoyed Steve Jones' his style. And you know, you you'd struggle to find a better rhythm guitar player. Mm -hmm. And um and Paul Fox, you know, the the ruts, so cool. Yeah. But I guess I started to look beyond the kind of prison of just trying mm. to play trying to almost like not offend people with your guitar playing because i just thought to myself hold on what is this you know i became a punk rocker because you know i, I enjoyed the way it gave you expression and it showed you hey you know what rules you know you, there are no rules you can right. make up your own rules Absolutely. so so when i started to have some of my punk friends kind of giving me rules you shouldn't play like that. It's like, hold on, that's a what are you saying? This that's not what punk rock's about. And and so because I wanted to expand on all these things. I mean, look, not all of us were doing that kind of thing. Some people don't have the time. Some people they want to dedicate their time to something else. I was never really a great sports player. Right. You know, I was always I was always good at running, 
because you had to run away from all the bloody skinheads all the time. You know, I, I was gr- good at that. I was re- never very good at football. I think I went through a patch where I was okay, but then quickly I wasn't, you know. It's just one of those things, if you're into sport, you have to keep doing it. It's the same as playing pool. If you don't keep doing it, you're not going to get any good. But with the guitar, that's where I, that's where I would go. My, na- my life naturally steered in that direction. My sister, she had a um, boyfriend, Harry Sayers, and he'd come home and he, he had a Stratocaster and, and he'd bring it round the house and he'd show me how to play these Thin Lizzy things. I thought, that's, that's fantastic. Mm. So I'd spend my time doing that. Sure. which I don't think is any bad thing. And yeah, this is the one thing that I must say, please, fans of punk rock and hardcore, please try and take a leaf from the book of the fans of rockabilly or psychabilly, because those fans of their bands, they really dig all the music that they do. They they appreciate it. They encourage it. We can do that too. Mm. There's, there's no harm. I'm not saying that there's nothing wrong with just playing you know, simple, dirgy, or even anti-musician. There's no nothing wrong with that, but there's also nothing wrong with going outside that. Absolutely. So, like, for instance, Bad Brains, the first time that I heard Bad Brains, come on, the first time you heard Bad Brains, it blew your mind. Dead Kennedys, the first time you heard them, it blew your mind. You Bad, Brains, to- Bad Brains was big for me because I'm in New York, I'm on the East Coast. Yeah. So... I saw them play, you know, 81, 82, again and again and again and again and again. Any right. chance, yeah, whereas the Dead Kennedys would come every now and then. The Bad Brains, I saw probably, you know, 30 so you, times. You yeah. kind of know where I'm coming from. It's like you, you, you can create a prison of your own making. Sure. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with the Ramones. I like it. Sure. You know, especially when I'm teaching the guitar to someone and – you know, they might come to me and they don't know what they want to learn. So I, you know, if they just like look at me with a blank expression, you know, and just say, well, I don't know what I want to do. You know, well, so we're going to do Blitzkrieg Bob then, you know. Sure. And I'd show them how to play. And I still enjoy that way of playing as well, you know. Yeah. But exactly. if you're able to sort of expand and keep going and keep going, and if you get a kick out of doing certain things, then keep going, you know, why not? You know, I'm yeah. still going now. So, I mean, it it, it can um, it can be a, a, a great form of expression and also it's almost a form of meditation as well. But it's it can lead to other things. Gotcha. Any any recollections of recording this, um, this era? Uh, are you happy as this? Are you happy looking back on this to the ends of the earth? Yeah, I remember that really well. We were in Cargo Studios in Rochdale, and it's quite a big, dark room. And the Pinch and Watty and John, they went in first, and they laid down the rhythm tracks. And um, I'm thinking that AD put down a vocal directly after them, I think. But then I did my parts, and when I when I went in, I'm just in this big old dark room on my own. <laughs> um, and I've not never recorded like that before. Sure. Suddenly being on your own. Oh, no, actually, no, I must have done. I must have done in the Destructors. Yeah, I must have done. But here I am in Cargo Studios. There's a great big room. And, you know, the uh, the mixing room is up on the second level. Oh. So they've, they've got a window and they're looking down at me, you know. Oh, boy. And um, so there I am in there. And I just put down this guitar track. And I, you know, I just did it. And then when I finished it, the first take, I looked up at the window and they're all clapping. They're all stood there clapping. And they, they just said, come in and have a listen to that. And it was the first take. And they, they just said, that's just exactly what was needed. Are you able to give me a couple of minutes so I can go to the toilet? Yeah, we're going to, let's take, you know what? Funny you should ask. Let's take a, let's take a sponsor break and uh, I'll see you back here in a couple of minutes. Okay, see you then. Thank you. Well, there you have it. His butt. We're going deep. Might go a little overtime today. Might want to keep that food on the oven there or whatever. But uh, this is a good one. And we're learning a lot. Music, the tie that binds us together. Hang in there. Let's uh, do some sponsor stuff and we'll come back and we will continue 
in our quest for musical knowledge. That's what it do. Welcome to NYT Comics at 117 Main Street, Dobbs, Surrey, New York. I'm Debo the Pro with my homie. Lee Farley. Welcome to the spot. Specializing in yesterday's and today's comic books, rare CGCs, toys, collectibles. Got skateboards, old school tapes, Magic the Gathering, Warhammer. Video games, original art, original art pieces by your favorite New York City and worldwide artists. Let's go. Skate decks all day, baby. We also have the young reader section here for like 10, 10 and under. Uh, the pops. People love the pops. Star Wars. Oh. We are New York Hardcore. We always rep the scene. Let's get it off. Oh! Will that be cash or debt? Do you mean debit? Yes. <laughs> Another eternal satisfying customer. <laughs> hey guys, Vlad from Organic Grill. As you can see, we're in a new location on West 3rd Street, right by Blue Note and Comedy Cell. The place is bigger, kitchen is bigger, we have more varieties, more food. We are looking forward to treat you guys with great dishes. All Hardcore Chronicles, welcome to, to Organic Grill. We are going to serve all the events as we usually do. And we are happy to see you guys. Since 1992, Generation Records has been a mainstay of the New York metropolitan area music scene. Today, they offer a diverse selection of new and used rock, jazz, indie, hip-hop, punk, hardcore, metal, blues, soundtrack, and reggae LPs, as well as t-shirts, posters, and other merchandise. They buy used record collections and music memorabilia and will pay you top dollar for them. House calls made for large collections in the tri-state area. Call or email generationrecords at gmail.com and follow them on Facebook and Instagram. And we're back. Somebody mentioned um, you can't comment on YouTube. Oh, God, I just hope I wouldn't doubt that it got flagged for copyright violation already. And and oh, fucking. Is anybody watching on YouTube? Tell me that. Tell me the fucking the, the show is still streaming on YouTube. God damn, man. Unbelievable. May they rot in hell. OK, good. I violated because <laughs> copyright violated my own fucking song. Unbelievable. All right. Maybe it's just you. Maybe it's just you, RS. You know? That said, hey, let's talk about some upcoming shows. This Wednesday, Youth from Killing Joke, Paul McCartney, The Verb, Pink Floyd. I'm excited about this one. Um, and then a week from then, it's the return of... Uh, because there is no show a week from today because it is the incendiary device. It's going to jump off tonight. Record release show one week from today. If Listen, let me tell you something, Bob. If you're in New York City, you better be at the show. I don't give a fuck about your wife. I don't give a fuck about your kid. I don't give a fuck about your job. doesn't matter. This is like, this is all hands on deck. All right? All hands on deck. Bring the booger eating kid, bring the nagging wife, bring your dog. I don't give a good goddamn. Just be at the Bowery Electric a week from today. All right? Seriously. Fuck. Help me help you. Um, Wednesday, November 15th, it's the return of the lunatic. I can't wait. Uh, non residents coming up November 19th. Joe Nelson from Trust Records, original singer of Ignite. We're going to talk about lots, including the new SSD control release. Our old friend, uh, Johnny Santos from Spine Shank and Civilian uh, um, and Silent Civilian. This one hasn't been announced yet, but listen, why not? 
Sunday, December 10th. We're going to bring the, the incendiary device guys on. We're going to talk about the new record. We're going to bring um, the guys that produced it. We'll bring Chris Ran on from Bridge Nine Records. Why not? Listen, if you had a show and you had a band, you do the same fucking thing. <laughs> so, there, so there you go, right? Um, Wednesday, December 13th, Johnny Temple from Girls Against Boys and Soulside. Um, Wednesday, December 27th, Mark McGram from Channel 3. Uh, Glenn Cummings, we just announced this the other day. Uh, Glenn from Scatterbrain and Ludacrist and Stone Deep will be on the show. And then, of course, episode 300 with Ray Capo from Youth of Today and Shelter. Uh, that said, uh, show needs your support. Show always needs your support. It's your support that makes this show happen. There is a Patreon page. And by the way, everybody, I, I think everybody that's on Patreon who got the book for free, um, the, the first book, the second book, um, if you're not a patron and you want the new book, it is available at www.stonefilmsnyc.com. Buy the book. They're both available. There's only 25 of the first book left, and I'm not going to be printing up anymore, at least not in the foreseeable future. So... Buy the book. It's a great way to support the show. You light up my life. Um, and there's the Patreon address. There's a PayPal address. Also, there is a, a super chat function. If you have a question for our guest and you do the super chat thing, it comes through in color. I can't miss it. You go to the front of the line. I want to shout out my latest patrons, uh, Christian J. Banks and Michael Simeon. Simeon? Simeon? Sorry. Sorry, Michael. Um, Thank you. Thank you for supporting. Thank you for enabling me, you enabler. Um, not all enabling is bad. Uh, yes, both books are well worth it. They're flying out of here like hotcakes. Um, that said, um, what else? Yeah, okay, good. I think, I think we, uh, we, we got through a lot. We got through a lot. Um, yeah, let's bring our guests back on. Let me clear the deck. Join Patreon, you cheap fuck. Um, there's a PayPal address, buy the book. But most of all, let me tell you something. Let me just, let me just reiterate this. Let me just, let me, let me just, let me just reiterate a little of this. I don't give a fuzzuck. Just get your ass down to the show. A week. It's listen. It's free. It's all ages. It's a block from where CBGBs used to be. What do I got to do? What do we got to show up and set up in your living room? Don't don't make me do it. Don't make me do it. That said, enough with these shenanigans. Let's bring on our our guest who's cracking up his butt. <laughs> Listen, it's I the New that. York way. It's the New York way, man. You know, get the fuck down to my fucking show. I don't. I'll, I'll fucking come burn your house down. Well, you know, look at uh, the end of all this, and be addressing. Uh, we are all punks here, okay? So, and if someone wants to uh, question that, and if someone wants to just give us one question at the end of all this, you know, what do you think is the most important thing, or what do you need to do, or what what do you think? If you're a punk, how can you, you know, what can you give to being a punk? Okay. What is the point? I can just sort of say, well, look, you know, at the end of it all, if you want to find out, if you really want to get to the core of what it's about, you know, do a gig, promote a gig, mm -hmm. you know, go out there and you make a gig happen, you know, yeah. because then when you're doing that, the whole process that you'll go through, that will show you what being a punk is about. You will then, yeah. you'll learn, you'll learn. You know, because you'll find out that people rally together, people help each other. And, you know, you'll find out, you know, what's important, you know, from actually kind of organizing your own show. If everyone did that at one point, you know, it'd help our club, our community. Just it just help us all out a little bit because we, we need all these things. And we don't necessarily need these gigs that are 50 bucks to get in either. Oh, know? hell no. And and 
you know, another thing that the, the shows that we do down at the Bowery Electric, which is a block from where CBGB's was, uh, mm. we do, we, they're free, they're, they're all ages, but they're really based on um, bands, bands ask to play. And I say, have you been down to any of the shows? And it's incredible how none of them said, no, I never have. All the bands that play are bands that come down and support the other bands. You And, and I'll say this again. I, I've said this many times. Anybody out there wants to play the Barry Electric, come on down to some of the other shows and support some of the other bands. Don't call Don't call and ask me to play if you've never even been. I've been doing shows down there for a couple of years now. Yeah. Well, you know, we've got – this is basically a, you know, a massive community. Yeah. And we want to keep this community alive and we want to keep Absolutely. it kicking. And, you know, one of the ways of doing that is the shows. That's how we meet. That's how we uh, socialize. That's how we, you know, we, that's how we get new blood. But yeah. it's also, you know, if you, the, the conversations that you want to have, that's where you can have them, you know? Yeah. So listen, you don't just, being a punk isn't just about sitting around a coffee table arguing politics. You know, if you want to argue about politics, you can do it at the gig. Yeah, you know, because it's the gig that's important. It's the music that's important. It's not just being a politician. You know, well, I, I, I think I think part of that too is people are so used to this whole thing now that that especially younger people that the real connection is is, is this is is the real connection is being face to face with people and actor and interacting with real human beings, not sitting on TikTok or Instagram. That's not real. No, we need the, the actual gig. I mean, where I live in Peterborough, we have um, a couple of people. We have like, there's a um, scary clown presents, and they're fantastic. I like that. I like that. They, they are amazing. Also, my friend um, Chris Lovell, he used to have this thing called uh, the Club with No Name, which is now starting that up again, which is great. Mm. It gives us more opportunities for our community to be together more often. And then it becomes more of a club. You know, you meet more people. It's just trying to keep this thing together. You know, we're trying to hold it together. And uh, we need the more opportunities that we get, as I said, not necessarily the opportunities where you have to spend, you know, 80 pounds to get through the door. Yeah. I mean, yeah. you know, I, I love, you know, I love the descendants. I love all those. Sure. Uh, you know, um, I'm not sure that the descendants would be that much to get in because they're, you know, they're a great band. But you know, some of the ones that are a bit, yeah, you know, they'll be they'll be charging, you know, the full whack to get through the door, and that's not necessarily what I want to be paying. You know, sure. Um, let's talk about forward into battle. Um, sure. a, be a beloved, a beloved uh, uh, album. Could you share with us any recollections? Uh, do, do you feel that in, in retrospect, uh, has it aged well for you? Could you give us some perspective oh, on it? Well, yeah, I mean, it has aged. Um, I mean, like for instance, in 2012, we uh, we went out on tour and we, you know, we did the Forward Into Battle album chronologically. Mm -hmm. And I think we did a really great job of it. You know, I was very happy with, with how we did that. When we did the album, as you hear it now, we were in the studio, we recorded it live. We had very little time. So basically when, um, once Pinch had got like a good drum track down, we had a minimal amount of time to just get down our bits. We had one week, we did everything in one week, Ooh. the whole thing. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm, obviously I wish I wish that we, we could have had a, a chance at just, if not more time, just, uh, Maybe a producer just because we didn't really have a producer either. So right. it was it was literally just a guy engineering it. Yeah. Um, but we did what we could, and I think you know the songs are great, and the energy is there. It's it's raw. It's very very fucking raw. There's no doubt yeah. about that, you know. And um, but it it's, it drew a lot of fans. So drew look, a at lot he, look at these young guys, huh? You see, another thing is what a lot of people don't realizes that the album nearly every lyric is a is based on war okay yeah. so um you know like some people kind of get the impression that by this time we were getting really heavily into heavy metal and all the songs were all about satan well well one of the songs is about satan 
Um, right. Well, there's a song on it called He That Is Bound Shall Be Freed. And I think that's just got some references to, there was kind of like, um, I think that, that if, if there's anything that just is maybe about the occult, not Satan, occult, is that song Nosferatu as well? Is it well? But we know that Nosferatu is basically the vampire, don't we? Sure. But um, like False Prophet is about evangelists. Every other song is based on war. Like Five Days Till Death is about execution. Um, Final Conquest, Ultimate Sacrifice, War Deal by Fire, Wall of Steel. They're all about war. Brainstormer is a instrumental. So. That is obviously, you could say that's about war if you like. <laughs> but it's yeah. an interesting. Yeah. So now, now, didn't didn't you um, come to the states for the first time on 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 in tour on that record? Yeah. Yeah. What, what was your initial? I mean, what was your impart on us your initial sort of uh, American adventure? Well, we went down very well. I mean, we had massive audiences. Um, that was a shock. Um, we headlined over UK subs, another shock. And um, Youth Brigade and, and DI, Wasted Youth, yeah. we headlined over these bands, which was Oof. a bit of a shock. You know, we were surprised. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, the promoter was saying, well, your album is, is the one that everyone's name checking. And... Right. Um, and we, we we literally, I mean, you showed that clip earlier on. We came over with our lousy, poor quality quality guitars that were going out of tune all the time. <laughs> um, I remember Youth Brigade, they were playing, like, they had a Stratocaster. And I think that my guitar, I snapped a string. So I, he lent me his Strat. And I thought, why didn't I have this all the way through the gig? <laughs> you know, this would have been yeah. a much better deal. But, um, yeah, it was so big. But I think the biggest experience, the biggest shock really was um yeah that many people the circle pits never seen that before mm. um that like three rows of skinheads at the front which were kind of like the security i found that to be a shock and also i couldn't get it you know um if you want to stop fights why are you having skinheads at the front you know what I mean? right right you know surely that's going to encourage it you know, it's strange but then again i know obviously there were festivals in the UK that have like the uh, Hell's Angels doing the security. Yeah, uh, I mean this 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 was still before I think what was this eighty six. This is still before I think people got um, the lay of the land, you know. Yeah, yeah, and uh, but the other thing that I noticed as well was there was a difference. I had this very strong Manchester accent. People couldn't necessarily understand what what I was saying at the time. Right. Um, and I think that because I was, you know, we had this kind of crazy hair, which that came from, you know, you know we used to use soap and, you know, we used to spike up our hair with soap. And then our girlfriends, they were sort of into doing this whole kind of thing with back combing and hairspray and crimpers. And, you know, they'd have their hair was more kind of big and fluffy. But we all got into that as well. So we had this massive hair thing and you, you know you gotta bear in mind this is before any of those la heavy rock bands were doing sure. That, you know? sure we were doing it from punk so like you, you've got to try and think okay so you think think of that classic image gbh great big massive spikes sure. and then you know that you know you're sort of you're back combing instead and you're using hairspray so i guess that would be more i don't know discharge but um, we were all doing it. We were all getting through the hairspray. We were all, you know, crimpers. You know, they they became the most important tool in your in your luggage. And um, so we were coming over to the states with hair like this and these accents. When you know, American guys coming up to us, and you know, they they thought, "What the fuck are you?" <laughs> you know what I mean? We, yeah. Yeah, so I, I remember, you know, being called a few names a few times. And, uh, was, was was it a pleasant uh, – did you guys make it through New York on that first trip? Yeah. Yeah, we played in New York supporting Wendy O. Williams. Oh, wow. Yeah. Interesting. So, yeah, and Nuclear Assault played on that show as well. Wow. Well, we played, 
We played in Baltimore as well, but um, obviously Baltimore's a little bit further north, isn't it? Was well, that, that was, at the, was that at the Ritz here in New York? The the, the Ritz, yeah, yeah, that's right. The Ritz yeah, Hotel. Yeah. I've got the poster. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, it's still there. It's called Webster Hall now. Yeah, right. Okay. Yeah, it's 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 uh it's it's still there. Um, yeah, when I first landed in New York, um, I was kind of befriended by. Uh, Please remind me of his surname, Danny, who used to be in Nuclear Assault. Danny Lilker. That's it. Stormtroopers of Death. Danny Lilker. That's it. And he was a nice guy. Oh, and he of course. He me around and he introduced me to the Crow Mags and, you know, oh, yeah. Agnostic Front. So he introduced me to all them bands. They came to the show. And he was just a very nice guy. He took me for pizza and just befriended me, you know. Yeah, here's a uh, here's a shot of him from my archive around that era. But you know, this is a classic Danny Loker shot. You know, there he is in the middle. And he used, he used to write to me as well afterwards. That's pretty cool. That's good. He used to send me tapes. Yeah, he lives up in he lives up in upstate New York now. He's he's somewhat retired. You know. Yeah. Yeah. Is it yeah. possible to do that? Yeah. I, well, I didn't think they, could do they, it. they pull they they pull him back they pull him back out. Uh, every now and then. Um, so how, how did, just just because I'm just moving things along, I, 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 we want to get to Prodigy and, and all that, but yes. how, how did the first sort of um, run era of English dogs play out? I know it was like, eight, you know, after the metamorph metamorphosis 12 inch around 87. Why, why did you, why did you put it to bed? Well, it's a big shame, wasn't it? It was just, the band was potentially great, but we didn't have a manager. Uh, uh, and because we didn't have a manager, I mean, we had a friend that used to help us out, mm. uh, Charlie, Charlie Joy. He was our buddy, our brother, and he used to just do everything he could to help us. But there comes a point where, you know, if you're going to go any further, then you need something going on. Um, that's going to sort of like enable you to, you know, to help you out. I mean, it's just like we didn't have an agent in the UK. So yeah. gigs were sporadic. Yeah. Um, it, it was just we needed that extra and we, yeah. we just didn't have it. Now, I, mean, I, I believe that if we had had it, everything would have changed for us. But sure. maybe maybe people thought well, that they've all, already got one. But because we didn't have a manager, um, most of the gigging – we didn't really go on a tour. I mean, we did when we did the States. That was a real tour. But in the UK, no, we didn't. We just it was just, just, it was just one offs a weekend. We just just, just, yeah, we yeah. were just gigging. Yeah. Now, if we'd yeah. have had someone saying, you know, come out on tour with, I don't know, the subs, UK subs, or sure. uh, that one way system, we were good friends with them. Um, oh, yeah. or GBH being the obvious one. But I don't, I don't know why that didn't happen. And I because, love one-way system. Love that band. Well, because it. Well, we were friends with all of those bands that I've just name-checked. We're all bands yep. that we were very close to. Sure. Amongst others, but um, that like GBH we were probably the closest to out of all of them. Yep. But it didn't happen. I can't really put yep. my finger on why it didn't happen. Maybe it didn't happen because of the crossover thing. Mm. Possibly, I don't know. I can't say. But all like all I'm saying is is that because of that, we didn't have any like we couldn't generate any income. You know, it was difficult to, you know, you're keeping everything. You're constantly putting money in all the time. There's never anything coming back. There's no one really helping you with the organization. Merchandise is a you know is chaotic. Um, just any thought, any form of, you know, like interviews with with you know any magazines any press it was chaotic because there's not enough of a there's no guy in there that's making sure that all these things are getting done and i think Gu the guidance guidance was needed yeah and i think that basically bit by bit we realized we were aware of our own limits you know we we uh we became aware that every band needs this driving force um a manager and you know you you can self manage you can you can do it to a point, but you know after a while you do get exhausted. 
and also your bank account gets diminished and you know you end up having like a massive debt and you've got to pay it off sometime so i think every band comes to that point of question mark you know i can't carry on like this yeah so it's not changing so so basically we had john murray leaving the band mm -hmm. and then we carried on as a four piece then we got another guitarist in and because john murray and pinch and charlie the three of them used to kind of like do most of the organizing once john had gone it was just pinch and charlie and as i said it was you know it was sporadic and that and then um pinch turned around and he's he left so then that kind of held a, yeah you know that passed the baton over didn't to me pinch, didn't pinch uh, is that when pinch left and and joined the damned no pinch left because he got his girlfriend pregnant and he just decided that the band he needed to start looking at being a, a you know a breadwinner well that'll do it <laughs> so so he he'd given it all he'd got and then he suddenly realized no i'm gonna have to start earning money and taking this situation seriously so then he passed the baton on to me I see. And, and i was just a, you know an 18 year old that had my contacts were well i could get us gigs with darren russell i could get us gigs at the hundred club i could get us gigs at leeds adam and eves and again like what i'm saying just i could do bits sure. but it wasn't it wasn't enough and then now, you know, now at the same time uh, weren't weren't you getting the were you getting desecrators happening as as a, 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 at pretty much the same time D didn't you wasn't that something you were diving into well the desecrators were happening before i joined the english dogs mm -hmm. so um and one of the reasons why they asked me to join was because i'd written this song called ban on impurity which was like a real early crossover song which was previous to when the english dogs did anything crossover um yeah it was it, it was that song and we had a song called clone to obey and those two songs were the kind of early early crossover tracks that i was writing them when i was in the destructors so those songs were at the very beginning of this whole thing and as i said like you know english dogs heard the songs and then they came around and asked me to join them so the desecrators were going all that time and the, desecrators, the desecrators were kind of more influenced by american hardcore so we had quite a following because we were more going down that route and a lot of the punks in the area that i live they were into the desecrators more than the english dogs <laughs> so you know right yeah we, we we were doing okay but it was always a small band and I, I was restricted with you know what i was capable of doing organization wise i didn't have the network at that time i had us you know four or five people i could call on and that was it got it um now I, i'm going to take a, a jump forward a little bit i i know uh uh you know a couple other things uh war dance and then and then english dogs gets you know gets rolling again i, I want i want to kind of move forward to to this era here um could you give us some perspective on how this came about yeah well that came about because we reformed the english dogs uh-huh okay so after um a bunch of years of you know yeah we I had a band called war dance and we got over to europe and we played with soul side mm. and um we did a lot of gigs in holland and belgium and then after that i came back um and kind of like got back in touch with pinch again and we started to sort of like get together and make music together again and then we just decided why don't we try reforming the english dogs and even get back to, get back the old lead yeah. singer wakey and wakey, yeah. get back the old guys so we tried getting everyone together and our friends gbh they said you know we can help you get a record deal which they did and then we went out to germany we did this massive tour of germany with wakey and it was like hilarious there was like you know hmm. everywhere you look there's a turd on the table or you know I, I remember like we were having competitions with each other where could we do a crap to offend the most amount of people oh my god and, um, 
yeah, I, I remember one time um, me and me and Wakey were doing this competition and, you know, I'd look around and, and, and you know, the rider, you're looking at the rider and someone's done a turd in the cornflake, uh, in the crisp bowl or something like that. It was just, it was hilarious, but it was awful, but it was great. Oh, you, oh, you UK guys, you know. <laughs> it was, it was, um, it was fun. And um, so one of our friends, Morat, uh from he's been friends forever so london based he was in a band called the soldiers of destruction and i knew him when i was in the destructors and the english dogs always knew him and um, they were always close with him and he was a big ambassador of the english dogs and he got in touch with um you know when we were doing like that when we'd reformed it he got in touch with us then and he was coming down to the gigs and he was reviewing them and he was putting, make, he was writing for Kerrang! magazine. Yes, this is the Morad I remember. He, he yeah. wrote for Kerrang! Yes. A massive magazine in the yes, UK. Yes. Yep, yep. So, he, so he was giving us great reviews. So we was doing this, we did this album called All the World's a Rage. And by this time I was singing in the English Dogs. So I'd gone, you know, can you imagine everything's going around and around. It's morphing all over the place. Now I'm the fucking singer, <laughs> you know, and, um, we did this album, All the Worlds of Rage, and Morat really liked it, and he was pushing it, and he was giving us great reviews. And we, we began to get accepted as a three-piece with me on vocal. We began to get accepted. So we were doing, you know, we were playing with GBH and with the Exploited, and it was looking good. And then, <laughs> then Morat phones me up and he said, I've put your name forward for this really big band that are looking for a guitarist. Is that okay? Now, you just got to try and bear in mind that, you know, that what I was telling you about earlier on, that the English dogs, they kind of fizzled out because there was no one managing it. Sure. So now I got myself into this position where I was managing the English dogs as well as, you know, so as well as writing, singing, playing guitar, I was managing the band, so I didn't have any money, so I was just basically getting loans and whatever and just paying for it, you know. But I knew that that's what had to be done. And um, But we were doing a fair amount of touring all over Europe. We had a record deal, but it was exhausting. Mm. And I was just getting to, you know, and I was on the dole when this was going on. You know, the dole is good old social security, you know, and I was claiming a housing benefit. And bear in mind that at the time, well, still now, you know, if you're claiming housing benefit, you, you're trying to claim this money. You've got to make out that you're living on your own. Yeah. Right. But I was living with my girlfriend, soon to be wife, Tracy. Mm -hmm. And um, but I had to make out that I was in this house on my own. And I had this guy like, a you know, from the council coming around to inspect the house. Oh. So I had to make the house look like no woman would dare go in it. You know, so I was like you know, trashing the place. I remember going around my friend's house, getting a load of like tankards, you know, like just a big collection of beer tankards and just filling them up all over the place, putting really shitty artwork, all that, you know, sort of like posters with naked women on. And, and you know, thinking to myself, this guy, whoever comes in, they are, they're not going to believe that a, a, a lady can possibly live in such a hole. <laughs> and I, I even just to, just to round it off, I did a turd in the toilet and left it in there unflushed. Oh, oh, so when they when they came in, they took one look. They went into the downstairs toilet, immediately turned around. Yeah, of course, you know you've got your bloody housing benefit. That's the that's that's so that's the catch, everyone. If, that's, uh, that's the trick. If, if the housing if the housing people are coming by, leave a turd. Take a crap in, and just leave it. Leave it, and um, so. I was doing everything I could and I was desperate, you know, and event eventually, you know, the doll, they get in touch with me and they say, you know, you've been on the doll now for two years. You're going to have to go on one of our schemes. You're going to have to go on this kind of, uh, I can't remember what it's bloody called, but it's like some kind of job scheme. And they, they said, you know, is it, you feel a bit, Oh Jesus, I can't, can I do this? This is awful. But actually they're offering you a lot of grants, you know, the, a lot of free money. Right. And you can use all their, you know, like at that time I didn't have a computer. I could use theirs. I didn't have a photocopier, obviously. I could use theirs. I, I had a telephone, but I wanted to use theirs. Right. <laughs> so 
So I would, they'd say, right, you're, nine o'clock, you're going to have the B of this job club or whatever it was called, you know. You're going to have to turn up, job club. We're going to give you a load of, like, tuition on how to get a job. <laughs> so I'd go, I'd go there and use the phone, you know, relentlessly and photocopying mm -hmm. flyers and all this. And then they gave me um, a grant, you know, which I used the grant. I called it market research, which was wow. basically going to gigs in London and hanging out, you know. This, so, this, is, this, is, this is important data that has to be researched. Yeah. So <laughs> I, was, I was there hanging out. And then when you're there, you see people are aware that you exist. So, you know, obviously I was bumping into Mo Rat and he was like, yeah, you know, you, you exist. <laughs> well, he knew I did. But um, but, it, you know, if you're not if you're not there, people don't know that you need it. You know, so so I'm, I'm hanging out at the bar at some gig, uh, probably Biohazard or something. And then, we, you know, we got um, Mo Rat and me chatting away. And then the next day, job club, get on the telephone. Hi, Mo Rat, how you doing? I had a good gig last time. It was great, wasn't it? You know, just staying in touch. Do you know what I mean? Because I couldn't afford to do that from my phone at home. You're going to get these massive phone bills. You know, nowadays it's not so bad. You know, you get these packages on your mobile that cost twenty five pounds. You've got sure. absolutely everything. Yeah, back then it was crippling. <sighs> five hundred pounds for a phone bill, no problem. Where yeah. are you going to get that money from? You know, so um, so yeah, so Morat was aware that I was looking to to try and do something. You know, sure. whatever it was. So then he turned around and said, "I put your name forward for this huge band." Is that okay? And then the next day, the phone rang. And sure enough, it was Keith Flint on the other end. I didn't know it was Keith. But he said, yeah, it's Keith. I've been given your number. And um, do you know what the band, who the band is? And I said, no. And he goes, oh, it's the Prodigy. And I go, fucking hell, wow. So they were, goes, so they, they, they were on your radar screen. You, you, knew, who the, you knew the band. that they, they were having, I mean, of, co of course, right? They were having success. Uh, yeah, they were having success, all right. Yeah. Well, um, with the English Dogs, when we were doing All the Worlds of Rage, you know, we were touring uh, in a car, supporting the UK subs. And this was the period of time when I kind of like started playing for the subs, mm -hmm. mainly, mainly because Al, the, the Scottish guitarist, he was just not turning up to the show. So I was filling in for him. Mm. And... Um, when we went on that tour, I think we just had like a cassette player in the car. You know, that's how it used to be. And uh, we were playing um, music for the Jilted Generation throughout that entire French and Belgian tour, listening to this stuff and um, really getting off on some of the tunes that the Prodigy were churning out because, you know, some of it was not a million miles away from punk, you know. Sure. Certainly had some... It certainly shared some um, qualities. Well, it shared the ethos for the. I mean, it had the spirit, just like we talked about Leonard Skinner pronounced Leonard Skinner. There, there was a certain ethos that was shared there. Well, it was some of the riffing as well. I mean, but yeah, there was definitely, you know, there was that thing that came out, wasn't the the. Um, oh God, there was like there was this this kind of there was an act that was passed through Parliament to try and stop raves. Um, hmm. and it was, it was a very old law that they were trying to bring bring in to basically, you know, to to ban raves. Oh crikey, what was it called now? Hmm. Got it on the tip of my tongue. But um, so people that were into that, you know, the into the rave scene and into the sort of really DIY, you know, let's organise a rave in the middle sure. of a field, let's do it ourselves, and then you manage to get two thousand people turning out to it. Well, what they were going through was similar in some ways to what the punks, you know, repression, you know, what we'd been going through. And let's face it, you know, I mean, punks have probably probably been the most, you know, one of the most hated forms of people of all time, you know. And uh, at, at this point, and I don't mean by everyone, I just mean by, you know, the the the, the world, the outside world. They'd look at punks and they'd say, what the fuck's that? Do you know what I mean? Well, that's what was going on with these fans of, you know, that form of music, you know. Of, uh, I mean, don't get, it's dance music. But in the case of the Prodigy, it was a, there was a hard edge to it. Mm -hmm. And um, 
as I, you know, some of those tunes were they definitely had a killing jokey feel to them. Sure. You know, mm -hmm. they they had a darkness. Criminal, criminal, criminal Justice. Justice Act. Is that right? That's, that's the one. That's these, the these, one. these are our these are our these are our friends in London that are chiming in. John in London and yeah and uh, yeah. and Gary. Yeah, Criminal Justice or Public Order Act. Yeah, that's that's the one. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so, what the dance generation, what the ravers were experiencing, we've experienced it. You know, sure. we've had we've had gigs being busted up. We've that's had right. we've had our faces being busted up. We've been chased down the bloody street by you know every person we've had people just looking down on us you know ever since we first got into it you know even though we generally we genuinely mean good you know the world would be a better place if everyone was a punk but unfortunately everyone else seems to see it in a different light you know they just see it see us as being well whatever they want to see you know mm -hmm. But um, so they were the ravers were getting that similar kind of treatment at that time, mm -hmm. which 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 kind of carved a sound and a style in their music, ah. which then we could empathize with it from our world. Kinder, kin, kindred spirits, kindred spirits. Kindred you spirits. know, dance music was was having a darker edge. The 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 note patterns, the chord sequences, the feel, the organic feel of it was starting to have a punk texture. And so, you know, it drew us in. So here we are driving around France in our Vauxhall Cavalier, listening to music for the Jilted Generation and thinking, you know, I like this. Mm. <laughs> you know, so, um, and then I remember hearing Firestarter for the first time. I thought, fucking hell, what's that? Yeah. And then, of course, the next thing I'm up on stage playing it. Was it was was it was there an audition process at all, or they knew your work? You, you know, just come in, be a pro. Uh, was there any sort of a feeling out process there? I had to do an audition. I mean, when Keith phoned me, he, he gave me the the vibe of oh, I want you in the band. Mm -hmm. I, I think that he'd he'd heard enough, um, but the rest of the band were, you know skeptical so they said no you've got to have an audition it's it's fair so I, that's what i did but believe me i mean i mo rat again was a, a an influence on this because he was saying to me he's phoning me up regularly saying you know how are you getting on with this and he said you've got to you've got to get this kids you've got to get it so i was like i had, a, I had my guitar on I had uh, a wireless pack. I put pumping the music through the house, and I was just like playing along to the stuff, you know, day in, day out, getting out sure. of bed, putting the guitar on, doing it all again. Sure. You know, I was in my in the English dog's practice room. I would sort of put the music on and just sort of play along and leap around. I'd, I'd invite friends to come over and watch. What do you think of this? You know, does it look? You know, can you give me any tips? I, I want to get this gig. Right. And um, yeah, I, I needed to get it. I went for it, and it and it worked out. I got the gig. Yeah, um, and I'm just trying to download this one shot here. Um, here we go. Yeah, okay. Um, I know, and you were part of not only touring on this monster but you played on some of this as well well believe me the prodigy is not like any other band yeah I, I i i excuse me doing my research you know today really looking into it it seemed it seemed like a very interesting dichotomy there of personalities and how things work there well to begin with you know there was never any rehearsals ever Wow. I, th I think, you know, I remember one time when I was really encouraging re a rehearsal, I was the only person who turned up for it. Wow. And um, so there was never any rehearsals. And the way how the band worked was Liam would come up with the music. So he would, and the way how we created the music was by collecting samples and, you know, creating drum loops. And he would 
build it and put it all together. Um, so I was trying to get in on the songwriting process, which I don't know whether I should have been doing that or not, but I, I tried to. Right. And and I was trying everything I could to sort of like open up that door. So I was making, I was collecting all this gear going all over the place, getting amplifiers, effects pedals, you know, guitars, everything. And I was um, going into uh, rehearsal rooms and studios and I was making uh, riff tapes, but, you know, on DATs. I was using a DAT tape, trying to get as high quality as what I possibly could. And... Um, and then giving them to Liam to check this out. I've got this, you know, a bunch of just guitar samples, loads and loads of guitar samples. And this was going on and on and on, you know, and I was like getting people, my friends, Andy Sneep, you know, amazing well, producer. Who, who plays who plays in Judas Priest now, right? Who plays in Judas Priest now. <laughs> so, uh, but an amazing producer and he's produced, you know, he's helped me with Jaina Stark, The More I See, mm -hmm. and The English Dogs. And so he's, he's produced those bands. Mm -hmm. mm. and um i was getting him to help me with these riff tapes but you know everything costs money and it takes time and then after a while i'm kind of thinking jesus you know what, what more can i do um i went into the studio with a guy called chris needs who is a writer uh, he's a great writer he, he's written for many publications um zigzag who used to write for them great old magazine um and anyway so chris needs he came out on tour with the prodigy he dj'd all right and he was very much you know we, me and him were, we got on very well he was a big fan of the clash you know huge ambassador there you go. we, so we, we love the, we love those guys we and anybody who's who loves the clash that's who i'm gravitating to right so yeah absolutely so me and him got on very very well so he suggested to liam why don't i do a, a remix of a prodigy song and i'll get giz in with me so me and him do it together so we did a remix of um the, the fuel my fire track uh the l7 track fuel yeah. my fire yep fuel my fuel my fire l7 yeah. but we did a remix of that so what we did i thought was fantastic I, I i thought it was great if you get a chance to hear it i mean it's making me wonder you know it's got to be out there online somewhere um it's got to be mm -hmm. so if you look online look on youtube just try and find it put mm -hmm. in fuel my fire chris needs right. and maybe you can find it and if it's i mean i've got a patron thing as well you know so uh, my patrons my subscribers i've let them hear all that kind of stuff you know it's uh you got to be careful with that kind of thing but if it's basically patron is you know if you like they're my friends i'm kind of you know mm -hmm. i'm share i'm sharing my archives my right. collection with my friends that's you know right. so and i think that's perfectly okay to do yeah so um so we did this amazing version of fuel my fire which sounds like a cross between <laughs> um, Motorhead, Metallica, and, <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's a great version. And um, Liam took a couple of samples from it and put it in the uh, Fat of the Land album. But right. um, but I, w I thought he could have used a bit more, but, you know, hey, it's not my band, is it? Yeah, so, right. What can I say? Yeah, and and it it's seems fun. it seems that, you came on board during a real glory run for them. It, 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 yeah. it, it, could you could you impart on us? I mean, it must have been just an incredibly uh, for you to 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 come on board. Uh, they they were just lighting the literally lighting the world on fire, right? Well, I mean, try and picture this. Okay, so we played at Nebworth, and um, this was the big gig that Oasis played at. Okay, so Ooh, wow, now, this, this gig, um, August 96. Oh, wow, yeah, so was, there was two gigs actually. I think that's right. I'm trying to remember anyway, so maybe there's just one. Anyway, so look, we do this gig, and I arrive at Nebworth, and uh, Phil, who was kind of like the back line tech, he was looking after Liam's gear and my gear. And Phil comes down from the stage and he says, 
come and check this out, kids. So we, we step up onto the stage. There's a curtain which he peels back and you, there's just people. It's, it's, it's like there's no sky left. It was as if the, the sky had just been taken away. There was just people. That's because right. you see Nebworth, where they positioned the stage, it was at the bottom of a hill. I see. So all you, it was like a you know a natural amphitheater. Sure. So all you could see was people. <laughs> it was yeah. bonkers. That's incredible. And it was like that a lot. Yeah. Yeah. And and, and you 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 basically you, you worked with them for a couple of years, right? How did that really? hand? How did how did that hand play out? Uh, were they just you know, did they just sort of dissipate and take a break and then everybody sort of wandered off? H how did that sort of play out? No, well, the thing is, although it was an, you know, it was a great break to happen and very interesting. Mm. Um, however, I was totally different to these guys. We had, yeah, very, um... we had very little in common. Mm. You know, I'm coming from a punk rock background um well i'm a punk rocker and you know I'm, i've willingly toured europe and i've been happy to sleep on people's floors do you know what i mean I've, I've been happy to just be in the back of a old transit van old diesel banging and shaking <laughs> your bones and going going you know zigzagging across germany you know like yeah. this you know and i've been happy to do that and then you who's, get to... who's booking this tour how can we go from <laughs> hamburg to right who the fuck is hamburg to leipzig yeah yeah, yeah. And, <laughs> yeah exactly yeah no you can literally you can go from saarbrücken to berlin then then right down to yeah. munich and then back up yeah. to hamburg you know the zigzag and you're trying to think how, how are we going to do the lo this is a logistic nightmare Anyway, but, you know, I was, I've done that and I've been happy to do it because, you know, I've got to the gig and there was, you know, 100, 200 people there that were, they were ready for a punk rock show and it was great. You know, I absolutely loved it. I had some fantastic times with those people. Now, all of a sudden, I'm with a whole different bunch of people, totally different kind of people. Now, you know, there's nothing wrong with that, but there comes a point where conversation can get a little bit limited. You know, it's tricky. You know, yeah, they, they might have heard of Bad Brains. They won't be able to, you know, they're not going to be able to tell you, you know, what did you think of Destroy Babylon when that came out? The production was a little bit right. different to the, you know, the green cassette, for instance. It's like, well, what are you talking about, kids? You know, we had nothing in common. Mm. So I couldn't have a conversation with them because it just got to a point where, you know, it's over, you know, the, the lines are crossed that what their knowledge was in one whole different area. My knowledge was in another right. area. Yeah. You know, they didn't know what the B side of Gary Gilmore's eyes was. You know, they don't have a clue about that. They not, don't care about it. You know, what, 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 who's the biggest influence of um, uh, Fagazi? What's their biggest influence? And they, they don't, probably don't know who Fagazi is. Well, that's probably not true. They probably do. But, we struggled with having things in common. Mm, interesting. I tried yeah. my hardest, Drew. I tried. Mm. I mean, you know, Liam did. He, he, we. There was a few times, like for instance, Liam introduced me to Wool, which of course is the Star the Brothers. Yeah, the Star Brothers, mm -hmm. and he introduced me to them. And I listened to that album and I, and I stole a couple of riffs. You know what I mean? <laughs> so, and also Liam was into Helmet and that was cool. I was already into them, but that made me into them even more. And Liam was also into Nirvana and Fire Nirvana, into the Foo Fighters. And then yeah. and we, got the, we got the Foo Fighters out on tour because he asked me, he said, who do you think we should have touring with us? And I said, well, that's easy. Let's get the Foo Fighters, you know? And he did that. So, and, and which, which, this was Prodigy? Yeah. Sure. So, yep. yeah, so there were some points where we could synchronize. Now and again, there was just the, the, the occasional point where it came together. Yeah. But then, you know, the rest of the time, you know, I was kind of like trying my hardest. You kind of rely on humor to keep everything going and to keep sane. Mm -hmm. But then the, the, when you're the, the outside guy, the humor actually becomes like everyone's kind of 
pointing at you all the time and you can take it to a point, you know, but maybe I could have carried on taking it, but um, it started to wear me down. I guess you were starting, you were really feeling like I'm the hired gun here. I'm, I'm, I'm the hired hand. Well, I just started to think that I was kind of, they enjoyed me being there for, you know, the sound and the look, but they didn't want, they didn't want me to get any more involved. That was yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's thanks for, thanks for, uh, for laying that out. Uh, Joe asks, didn't Prodigy play Woodstock 94? Was Giz a part of it? So knows the answer to that. No. Okay. Fair, fair enough. Um, hey, let's um, let me take my, my quick sponsor break. If you have to use the restroom, uh, yeah, I'll do, 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 do you have a time constraint? Do you got to get going soon? Or can we do another 20 minutes? Take some questions from around the world. I'll do another 20 minutes, mate. Yeah. It's good. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead. I'll see you in a few. Okay. Well, there you go. Lots going on today. This is the New York Hardcore Chronicles live. It's alive. Our guest is Giz Butt. And we did just get through the prodigy. Questions? Um, please post them. We, 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 didn't, we, didn't, we didn't touch on a lot with this guy. He just played this on the Scream Tour. Um, so any let, so let's let's do questions. Let's let let's let's get to the let's get to the heart of the matter. This is the New York Hardcore Chronicles Live. We are sponsored by blah, 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 and 126 Hardcore Clothing. They're a streetwear brand for restless individuals who don't compromise. They're about being positive, spontaneous, and true to yourself. For years, they experimented through with several printing methods and materials and collaborated with a large number of designers and illustrators, always giving room for fresh perspectives while retaining the hardcore attitude. Don't care what, don't care what you may say. We got that attitude. Get in touch with them. Ramp up your game at www. 126clothing.com. Come on now, Joe Romini and the Texas Silver Rush. They're a jewelry design firm and boutique store located in the birthplace of the Texas country music scene in Fredericksburg, Texas. They specialize in working with musicians and all music genres that design and create unique one-off pieces, as well as the style them for stage, album, cover, album covers, promo photos, and social media exposure. Their client list includes Rock Roll Hall of Famous, Greg Rolay, Ringo Starr, and of course, your friends and mine, Agnostic Front. Information online sales are being taken at their Facebook and Instagram page. And of course, www.thetexassilverrush.com. Last but not least, and this is the last time I'm reading this copy. They sent me a new copy today, but I didn't get it together in time. Upstate Records, they're a New York-based DIY independent metal and hardcore label founded in 2017. They broke it to the scene with their inaugural 26 grand compilation. And six then have churned out over 80 releases in their brief five-year history. Out now are new releases by Mark Rizzo's band Revenge Beast, Car from Earth Crisis, Fryer, Fury of Five Angry Corpses, and a few more surprises in the works. Check them out and a whole lot more at www.upstaterecordsnewyork.com. New copy coming soon from Upstate Records. Uh, post, your, post your questions. Let's go. Go deep. Get weird. Come on now. Uh, just want to remind everyone that this Wednesday, yay, 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 youth from Killing Joke will be on the show this Wednesday. There will not be a show one week from today because you, my friend, will be down at the incendiary device. It's going to jump off tonight. Record release show at the Bowery Electric. We are playing with the mighty Rebel Matic, the Craze, Cortisol, and Pembroke. So if you're in New York, if you were in the tri-state area, you better be at the show. Don't make me do bad things. Because I will. Um, that said, just a reminder -er -er about the... Do we do all this? Yeah. Um, hey, I didn't mention this. Um the I am I am giving out an award at the I'm having a hard time reading the date January seventh uh, seventeenth uh, the Extreme Music Awards in um, Albany New York I am a presenter I am presenting an award and I am showing the trailer for my new film 
the new film, which everyone knows what it is, but it hasn't been announced. Extreme Music Awards, members of Slayer, Exodus, Overkill, Biohazard, Hatebreed, Rancid. I will be there giving out an award and showing a trailer to my new film in upstate New York. Everybody come through. Tell them Drew Stone sent you. Uh, that said, um, post your questions. Let's get our guest back on. Here we go. Giz Butt. Are we, yeah. Hello. How are you doing? <laughs> hello. Are we back again? Yeah, yeah. Okay, let's let's have some fun with this. Let's see what we got. Oh, you know, um, yeah, let me see. Uh, this is a good one. Um, yeah, let, let's do a little gear thing. Giz, Marshall, Orange, or Laney, Gibson or Fender, what's your gear? Well, okay, right at this moment in time, I, I'm Marshalls. Um, I'm endorsed. I've got an endorsement with Marshall. So um, I have a JVM 410, which is a fantastic amp. So my preference is definitely Marshalls. And um, at the moment, I'm using Gibson Les Pauls. But last year, I was using Fender Strats. So, I mean, I've been endorsed with Ibanez guitars for years and years and years. But I, again, I'm one of those players where I kind of, you know, I can't help but think, look, if I want to play a, another guitar, I, I want to play it. You know, sure. if I want to. Although I think that that's kind of one of the things. If, if you get an endorsement, you know, you feel like I just want to play that. It's, yeah. With Mar with the amplifiers, it's no issue. Marshall amps, fantastic. Don't need to use anything else. Yeah. Um, but guitar wise, they're all different. You know, I can't help but love Gibson and Fenders. You know, and can't help but love Ibanez is, as well. Whatever. Is this a question? Is this one of the Ibanezes? Yeah, that's a great guitar. Yeah, that's, they made me that one. Um, so it's a custom made Ibanez. It's it's kind of the, the idea behind the guitar. They they wanted some input and they said to me, um, if you could build your own guitar, what would it be? So basically I, I went and got a Gibson Melody Maker and um SG and I kind of like drew the body on some put them flat down, drew the outline, and then just basically drew in between the two guitars. So the body shape is in between an SG and a Melody Maker. Wow. And the um, So I wanted the two pickup configuration. That's got Seymour Duncan JBs. Good pickups. It's got a Floyd Rose tremolo system. Um, those, those Floyd Roses are great for keeping your guitar in tune, but these are the tremolo systems that I prefer now. So this is... Um, um, fucking hell, hold on. it's a Vega trim. Sorry, you'll have to excuse my dizziness. I've got jet lag. I've only just <laughs> I'm falling asleep all over the place. You know, it's I'm okay. I can I can hardly string two words together. It's amazing that we're doing this. Yeah. Um, so yeah, this tremolo system is great. So listen, I'm I'm gonna just give you a little bit of an <coughs> example. Please do. I haven't prepared myself for it, so don't expect anything amazing. You know, but, uh, okay, so um, uh, the guitar is roughly in tune. I could make it a bit more in tune. I've got an app on my phone. Hold on a sec, tuner. <laughs> so this is what I'm going to do. Just excuse me, everyone. Go ahead. As we tune up with Giz Butt, any questions, please post them. This is the New York Hardcore Chronicles Live. Oh, there you go. I haven't done anything. I've, I've just picked it up. Okay, so let's listen to how it sounds. Okay, I could get through a gig on that. But I mean, Absolutely. of course, if I stretched the strings and really gave it some, do you know what I mean? It could, you know, it, it, it would cope with the, basically the trick is with, with 
a guitar, if you use a, a traditional style trem that doesn't have lock nuts, all right? If, mm -hmm. So if you use one of those, one of the reasons why you use them, there's a couple of reasons. One, because you like the look of them. And then the second reason is because you can very quickly get down to a drop D tuning. You can very quickly do that. The whole, you know, you can kind of keep most of the tuning together. It only takes you about 30 seconds to get the whole guitar in tune. And then you can use a drop D and, you know, you're off. Um, why would you use a tremolo? Well, why not? It's, it's, it's fun, you know, for God's sake. You know, just listen to a bit of Van Halen, for God's sake. You know, it's, it just sounds amazing. Yeah, I saw, I, saw you I saw a clip of you playing Eruption uh, when I was doing my homework for the show. I was like, oh, wow, there you go. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you can use a tremolo if you, you don't have to use it the full hog. <laughs> Or you can, you know, you can just kind of, uh, let's say. Yeah, I mean, Dr. No used to use it and it sounded great. Didn't it? Sure. Dr. No used to play that BC Rich, I remember. I don't think they're the greatest guitars. They've got yeah. very, very thin. He had some weird, be old, some weird, I think it was a Mockingbird, maybe? I don't know. Yeah. yeah. Could, could, could have been. Yeah. Uh, here's one. Here's one. Uh, good. I, I like this one. Uh, what's the story behind playing bass in uh, in Sabat? Why would Andy Sneap offer a guitar player <laughs> bass duties? Good question. That's a good no, question. Literally, for, for only one reason. And that's because I'm his friend, you know, and because he was having, you know, Sabat, they reformed um, for a tour, but their bass player didn't want to carry on. He, after something like three or four gigs, he, did, he didn't want to carry on. Fraser. Yeah, it's, that's the name that's coming back. I'm sure it's Fraser. Mm -hmm. So... So Andy just turned to me and said, what do you think about you doing it? You know, would you be up for it? Because I'm just, literally just because I'm his friend. So what, what was it? Enjoy it must. I mean, I'm assuming it was enjoyable to be out there with your friend. And 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 yeah, why not? Yeah, it was really good fun. I had, I had a good time with them. I, I, I like playing the bass. I actually do yeah. like playing it. So um, um, I've got no issues with doing that. And yeah. uh, but bear in mind, the What's number that? one thing. What's that? That's just what a telecaster, but it's a great one. So mm -hmm. this this has got um, bare knuckle pile driver pickups. They're really great pickups. So Can I see the headstock? Um, do I have to show you the headstock? <laughs> <laughs> no, do you I, don't. You don't have to. Because this is hilarious. This guitar is actually a very old ESP, uh -huh. um, and someone. I got this off a friend of mine. He I literally got given this guitar. It's an ESP, but the guy, he's... Oh, wow. He's used um, sandpaper or, or emery cloth or something like that, and he's filed off ESP, and he's tried to put a Fender transfer. What? <laughs> and it, it's, it's disappeared. I mean, what a stupid thing to do. The guitar's good anyway. You know? uh, Jonathan S. What's your favorite riff you played in The Prodigy? Please play it. It's a bit late to be playing those kind of riffs, and I'm in yeah. a house with a family. So right, right. Um, right. But you know, I mean, if I'll, we'll try something. I mean, my favorite one is without a shadow of a doubt going to be. Which is a there you go. Yeah. But I mean I'm trying my hardest to not play too loud. You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, yeah, let's not, we, we don't want to get you. Well, well, the main riff that I used to play over that um, was the, um, was that riff? The... That's 
that riff, which I thought was pretty cool. Um, uh, our uh, our friend uh, uh, Jay Curtis Strickland asks, tell tell a stark story about backing up the interstate with a fireworks display. Um. Well. Oh God! Hold on, wait a minute. I have done a gig where I've had to what play. What did you do? <laughs> I, have, I have done a gig where I've played with a um, firework display before, but it's not. Well, yeah, it was just literally some friend um, who was putting on this firework display, and he was doing it at the school that my kids went to. And um, he just asked, oh, we want to do kind of like a display for Firestarter. Can you play it and you know, come on and and um, play live to it? And it was, uh, you know, very cold. Um, the guitar wouldn't stay in tune. It was a, a, a little bit weird because it's just me playing on this big stage with an enormous firework display going on on my own. <laughs> Mm -hmm. with, with a backing track in the freezing cold you know um yeah not the greatest all right, all right. um this i have a visual to go with this um question about scream i know you did some of these shows uh with soul side uh pat ball would ask any plans to record with scream in the future or will it strictly be live shows either way you're a great addition to the band. I, I would not be putting on any pressure whatsoever for on the band for me to participate in writing or yeah. recording with the band. I don't think they need that extra pressure. You know, I'm happy just to be with them. You know, this, this let me tell you something now. When you when you join a band, every you get all these outside voices all going, Oh, what are you gonna be writing with them? Maybe you'll do some recording soon. You know, it's like for God's sake. Yeah. You know, don't you think the band already have a hard time enough just getting everyone included anyway? They don't necessarily need – why would they need me? You yeah. know, they, they're great at what they do. If, if something's not broken, don't try and fix yeah. it. Sure. When, so when you when you did that – right. When you did the Soul Side uh, tour, was Johnny Temple out with them? Certainly was. Yeah, because he's coming on the show soon. Yeah, yeah. and you must – Ask him about fake names. I love that. Yes, part. right, with Brian Baker. Right, absolutely. Yeah, no, I was with Johnny. I mean, obviously, we did the shows together. Um, and then when I went to the airport to come home, who's in the airport? Johnny's there in the airport. So we both sit down and have a coffee together and have a chat, you know. And hopefully, it would be really nice if uh, the whole package could make its way over to the UK and Europe, you know. Yeah. I know that I'll be, you know, I'm. I'm kind of trying to encourage that to happen gently. Makes makes sense. Um, as we as we head down the home stretch, um, I I have to, you, you know, one one band we didn't touch on, which I tell you was a band I kept coming back to this week. I just really really enjoyed the catalog. Um, did this band did this band evolve basically straight from English Dogs? Was it sort of like a morph from English Dogs? Yep. Okay. So um, what happened was All the World's a Rage. So, so if, if you ever get a chance to check out that album, please do. Yeah. The, the, um, the, the, the album that you sang on. Yes. yes. Yeah. So if you get a chance to listen to that, and also we did like a um, an EP called mm -hmm. What a wonderful, what a wonderful feeling. feeling to be fucked to over by everyone. By everyone, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, so we we did that, and now that band was the beginning of Jane Stark. So we were we were touring the, those releases through Europe, and I was beginning to write these slightly different kind of styled songs. I would say that they were more stiff little fingers inspired and maybe a bit of jam as well but basically you know that kind of thing there was a whole thing coming through at that point therapy china drum mm -hmm. some great great bands and they all had a little bit of a i don't know stiff little fingers thing about them in the case of therapy maybe they had a bit more of a, a bit of a killing joke thing in there too or whatever 
it was good stuff. And so I was beginning to write songs that were more, more like that, you know, but, but whatever, a lot of people were coming up to me all the time and saying, why don't you change the name of the band? Because yeah, English dogs are this kind of band. That's them. Sure. And now you're this kind of band. You're a different kind of band, but you know, it's good. And you could, you know, you could get somewhere with this, you know, and, uh, we were having a lot of people constantly saying this to us. So anyway, this really came to the front when when I joined the Prodigy and um, we had an accountant, a fancy accountant. It was the same accountant as the Prodigy one. It was probably trying to get me to sort of like, you know, a bit of hiding the money on the next day, but whatever, you know. Um, he was saying get the whole band in let's have a meeting let's go and help help the english dogs out let's give the english dogs a bit of a helping hand so okay brilliant get the whole band in right you know you you're going forward now how about reg registering your name english dogs let's register it and um go forward as a business you know sure. so we tried to register the name but it was impossible because it had already been registered by someone in something like the 16th century you know oh. by <laughs> an english dog breeder and sure, then, of course and bear, bear in mind that we've just been offered a record deal by earache records so right. so we've been offered a record deal things were moving and it looked like there was going to be doors open and you know this this accountant he said look you've got to bear in mind you're now you're you're in the prodigy now things are going to change you're going to get offered a load of stuff things are going to change mm. you need to make this english dogs thing sort it out right so we just, you know the idea was we're going to change the name we've got a whole new set of songs um one we, had, we, we did what bands do we made lists of names but then um one day i had radio one which is you know obviously radio one it must be the biggest radio station in the uk so it's also the worst but whatever. Um, so they ask me, they actually phone me up and they do an interview with me and they say, so what's going on? Um, apparently you've got a, a new band and you're, you're being signed up and, you know, and you're going to have an album coming out. You're going to be recording a new album. What, what's the name of the band? And I had to think on my feet. So I was thinking of this list I'm very, you know, like I said, 500 names, you know, and I'd, I'd asked all the prodigy guys, what's your favorite name? And, you know, trying to make my mind up, what are we going to call it? Some of these names were terrible, you know. Some of them ended up becoming song titles. Mm. That's handy. Yeah. Or, or lyrics. Don't let anything get wasted. That's so, um, yeah, I needed to come up. I, I just had to think on my feet and I just said Jaina Stark. And that was it. And I think, I think at the time, Pinch was in his car and he literally nearly had an accident when he heard that, you know. He's like, what? <laughs> yeah, Jane has and, and, and And was that true to form? Did things really, you know, due to sort of the affiliation with Prodigy, did things, did things really, oh, did a couple of doors open up? Um, I, you know, and, and I have in my notes, you know, the song Every Little Thing Counts, yeah. my notes are, the reason this song was popular is because it's a great fucking song. And also I have to take, you know, pay my thanks to Franz and, and Pete because that's the one that's influenced by a wool song. <laughs> ah, there you go. So, um, yeah, well, that song's kind of, yeah, it did, did good, that track did. And also, um, yeah, because of what was happening, Jane Stark were in Kerrang! week in week out you know excellent but bear in mind my touring schedule with the prodigy at that time was non-stop Oof. so i couldn't get time to practice right so i remember we did once we we got a really big gig um a Kerrang gig we were supporting human waste project oh i remember we, them yeah we didn't have a chance to do any rehearsal because i was just constantly on the road See, when you're in a band like The Prodigy, you don't just, it's not just the touring, it's the endlessness of everything. You get, you know, you, you've got to do press tours, you've got to do um, photograph sessions all over the place, you've got to do 
um, you know, there's things going on in London. You get asked to do, to attend a, a party, an event. You get asked to do things. You, you, you have to do them. Yeah. And so you're trying to find time to rehearse. And uh, I remember I was doing this gig and the human waste project, but yeah, they blew us into the weeds. They were much tighter than us. We, we were, that taught us a lesson, you know, we're going to have to somehow. It was a wake up call. <laughs> yeah. We needed to find the time to rehearse, which eventually we got. And then eventually we came around to being a really good live band and getting good live reviews. Yeah. Hey, I want to, um, as we head down the home stretch, I want to bring a friend of ours on who's, of course, a big supporter of the show, uh, Paul Stone. What's up, man? Good evening. I've known that man a fucking long, long time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I remember you. I remember you. I'm sure yeah. you are. I'm sure you owe me ten pounds. <laughs> yeah. I think you owe me fifteen. Yeah. Um, no, I think you're wrong. Um, uh, I remember going to where was that? We used to go to Bradford in that club um, with oh, John. Palm Cove. The Rio. Are you sure it was a Palm Cove? The, we, we, the Palm Cove was the place we used to go to way way back in the day, uh, and I saw you supporting the Misfits with English Dogs were working. Yeah, uh, now hold on. You've just reminded me the, the Misfits, right? You've reminded me. Cool. You've reminded me this. No, that Misfits tour was when I was singing. Yeah. Yeah. And now you said earlier on, did you say two two eight eight? What was that? What was what's the relevance in the number two eight eight? Because you said it earlier on, because that made me think of the Misfits. We are two eighty eight. <laughs> no, one thirty eight. We are. I know that. We are 288. <laughs> but it, you came up with that number. What was it for? I can't remember. One hey. of the things with two heads. Did you, you, when you had the, the, the theory for the right in the riffs. The, the, the what? The right in the riffs? Yeah, you, you had some like a, a mathematical theory for right in the riffs. You know, I've got so many theories. Gasworks? For... Is that it? The Gasworks? Oh, that's um, way later than that. Later, what? Wait, okay. Is, it, what, is that in Bradford? Yeah. Why is do it? I remember? Why do I remember a place in Bradford? The Rio wasn't the Rio in Bradford. Yeah, but I'm just yes, trying to remember. Where, I'm trying to remember where me and Stoney and Jono went to. Ah, it was. Uh, went to Palm Cove and Adam and Eve's. Adam right, and Eve's well, in Leeds a lot. We definitely did Adam and Eve's. I know that. Do you remember the yeah. old? When, when I'd stop round Jono's house, he'd always take me to that curry house on the way home. We'd always Go get a veggie curry. Do you know yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, maybe you're thinking of um, Royal Standard. I think it might have been 238 Manningham Lane, possibly. Right. But that's going so, back a long, long fucking time. Hey, hey, hey Stoney, uh, could you... You know, any give us an early recollection, English dogs, or like how they come across your radar screen. Could you give us any perspective? And thank you, and um, thank you, and thank you for helping me set this show up. I really appreciate it. You're to blame, Stoney. It's always me. Always me. Yeah. Um, so, to be fair, well, it's Adam and Eve's, isn't it? it? Must be Adam and Eve's, surely. Yeah, yeah. Adam and Eve's, uh, and Scrumpies as well. English dogs played Scrumpies. Um, and the hangovers in Halifax for Eddie's yeah, birthday. That's that, right. That was a fucking a wild gig with, with people headbutting people who didn't know their postcode. You know, there was a gig that we did in Leeds, and I missed the van in Grantham, and they just left me a tenner to, um, to, to go and get a train, right? And I jumped on a train to Leeds, and there was a bunch of football supporters on there, and they were all... they. Bags full of cans of beer, do you know what I mean? And they were saying they saw my hair you know, out here like this, and they said, Oh, look at this one here, you know, come on, come here, mate. Do you fancy a beer? Yeah. But, you know, and they were just very generous, pissed as fast, giving me like can after can after can. By the time I pulled up in Leeds, I was half caught. I had to get a taxi. I, um, I don't even know how I did get to the venue. If I got a taxi or a bus, I can't remember. Can't remember how I got there, but I got there, and you know, and, and I was pissed as a fart it was um good and bad mm. if hey, i uh, remember right that gig 
was Adam and Eve's when it was the desecrators and it was broken uh, bones. Was it broke? Yeah, we had Nick Chokshek and GBH, broken bones, test your babies and desecrators. If I remember right. Well, we played with, we, we played with broken bones at Adam and Eve's, right? And we had a bigger following than them. We had more people. Gone. We had more people there than what they did. And at the end of the night, they, they got given the money for the gig and they didn't give us a single pound. Oh. Not one pound. Oh. Yeah, that were the days. Yeah. It's really, it's really mean. Yeah. To be honest, yeah. my my favourite memory of Giz was probably me and him going to see Megadeth at Hammersmith Audion in 87, the first gig. Do you remember Mustaine Dave? Fucking mortal. Do you remember Dave Mustaine falling over on stage? Yes, breaking the head suck off the Jackson. Hardly anyone can remember that. Me and you, I we, we cried the whole time. <laughs> he was what? drunk as fuck and coked out of his tits. Jeez. <laughs> yeah, those Jacksons we were laughing. brand new. And it was like, do you remember the old comedy sketches with the um, the shepherd's crook and the pull people oh, off? Yeah, sure. sure. Yeah, they pushed Benny him back Hill. on like that. They dragged him off, and the headstock was like smashed and the strings flying and they gave him another guitar and threw him back on he's like Ehh! back into a solo in the same song and me and Giz were like what fuck it's just like a three thousand pound guitar destroyed and we cried all the way back hey, to fucking peterborough the hey funniest... sony this this picture you sent me are these are these are these your tapes the picture you sent me oh these Ah, there they are. War Day. Oh, nice. Whoa. Let me see. Yeah. Right. Precious. Ass <laughs> <laughs> Precious. Oh, in the vault. Um, yeah. yeah, every little thing counts on there. Uh, Rose Garden funeral. Um, gives this crossover stuff with desecrators was always like. Uh, I was saying, Giz's fingers. My fingers as a guitar player are like little stubby things. This fucker's got fingers like spiders. <laughs> Makes me sick. Yeah, wait. Well, what can I do? Yeah, what? look at look at them. <laughs> Fuck off. Um, yeah, well, yeah. I've, well, I've known him a long, long time. My mate John O'Connor and Giz's mate John O'Connor introduced us in like '85 or something. Um, and it was always the guitarist to look up to, like, how how can a punk guy play like that? I, I can play a bit. How long can a punk get? How long like, can a punk get? How, how metal can a punk get? Yeah. But that, I'll, I'll, say, I'll say this to you guys first, and I've said it for years and years. The um, the spiky red washburn that you saw in the videos earlier, mm. I think that guitar stayed in tune for about two minutes at a time, ever. Yeah, it was awful. It was, it was. It was terrible. Um, but, but I mean, you see, if, when we, when again, we played, um, if I had the knowledge that I have now, then I would have put a decent tremolo system on yeah. it and made it stay in tune. You know, because yeah, I, yeah. I do get guys from the States getting in touch with me. They're big fans of, of the English dogs and they, you know, they, they, they've gone out and bought that guitar. But what they've done is they put on, you know, like yeah. a, a Kayla tremolo system or, you know, some, something that stays in tune. And uh, so it is possible. It's just, it. you know. Yep. Yeah. To be honest, uh, the hey, one hey, thing that, that I think uh, we've we've not missed that we've, we've it's remiss to say at this point, uh, which is a, a real Sunday word, um, and uh, hopefully Giz won't mind me saying this, but I know for a fact that um, a certain really really big thrash metal band was a huge fan of uh, Forward into Battle into the Ends of the Earth, and Mr. Hetfield uh, and Mr. Hammett were, it's fair to say. Massive fans. I remember the Bradford gig um, and the mm. Mass Republic show, and those guys were fawning over your playing. And 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 what a, what a day that was! Watching Metallica sound check was a joy I will never forget. And I only got that from you. So, Giz, I owe you a drink for that, if nothing else. And I intend to make sure you play some guitar on my shit at some point. But yeah. seriously. The, the respect you got from those guys that day was mind blowing as a mate of mine to see those people go, This this man, fuck, you know what I mean? Um, they really, really got it straight away. And Hetfield's been on, on record in the 80s 
as saying forward into battle was one of his favourite records. Full stop. Yeah, that's fair to say. It's no exaggeration. Go Google it. It's there on, on YouTube all day long. Right on. Hey, hey, Giz, Giz, I have to ask you what um, the future. Where's it at? What are you looking forward to musically? What's happening? What's on the horizon? So I've been doing some um, interesting stuff with Jaina Stark. Uh, I would recommend to everyone check that out. Obviously, I've got that going on in the background just to give you a big hint. Um, we've signed to Time and Matter Records. And that's the same label as UK Subs. And um, so I would say, please check out the Jaina Stark stuff. Um, not only do we have the, the three albums, which is Face Your Biggest Fear, Angel in the Flames, and of course the debut album, Great Adventure Cigar. But we've also got a ton of stuff on Bandcamp. So if you put Bandcamp, Jane the Stark, it's great. you're going to find, and I'm trying to, what I'm doing is I'm digging all these old tracks out of the archives. This was a lesson that I learned from Ian McKay. He took me up into the Discord records offices and he showed me the archive rooms that they've got there, which are an amazing thing to see. You get the first rehearsal tapes of Bad Brains and all this sort of stuff. And he showed me that and he made me think, well, that's, I'm like that. I collect everything. I record everything. You know, just gone over and done the screen shows. I've filmed every single gig and, and I've done it because it's documentation. It's valuable. You know, it's a good thing to have. One day we might want to pull it out and use it. Um, and obviously I've said being with Scream, being in Scream is an absolute pleasure and an honour. And they are such brilliant and wonderful and lovely people. And as long as I, as long as they can put up with me, as long as I, you know, they're okay having this limey around with them, then I'm, I'm with them. Do you know what I mean? As, as long as they can put up with me, you know, I'm happily be with them until until they turn around and say, we haven't got any more shows, you know, but, but as that's why I said earlier on, you know, I'm not going to be tapping them saying, Oh, uh, any chance of um, being on the next record? I'm not going to do that. I'm just yeah, not going to do that. Cause, cause that is a high maintenance band member that, I mean, not necessarily, but you know, I don't, they've already got like the three musketeers, you know, yeah. that are, you know, they can they can write and record a good album on their own. They don't necessarily need, you know, anyone else, but they'll get the they'll get it if they want to use it, you know. But I certainly won't be applying any pressure because that's what's got me in trouble in the past. Right. I've got to be honest, for for, for Scream, uh and this is the same as me. In eighty six, Scream was the first Discord band to make it out of the States, as far as I'm aware. Um in eighty six on my 18th birthday, I saw that band absolutely destroy Adam and Eve's in Leeds, and I've really seen much better gigs than that. So to see my mate playing with them, and bear in mind how good Skeeter is as a bass player, and how good um, Francis is a guitar player, to hang with those people is no fucking joke at all. Francis is a fucking really, really good guitar player in the song. Yeah. Jimmy Hendrix a punk. Yeah. yeah. He's... And wait till you hear the new album. I've, I've heard, heard, I can't wait. You slide back. You haven't said my mind yet. Where? Recorded at Inner Ear Studios with Don, right? I've heard. Where's it. my copy? Yeah. 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 yeah Where's we, my copy? When I was in Antidote, I was just looking for the flyer. We played with Screen and, and Scream in 1983 on the lawn of the Lincoln Memorial. Jesus. Yeah, I got that somewhere. Hey, Paul, I want to thank you for stopping by. And once again, I want to thank you for, uh, for connecting me with Giz. Uh, anybody you want to thank or shout out? Um, basically, Giz for being a mate for 30, nearly 40 years. Christ almighty, I don't even know. John O'Connor for introducing me to Giz. Um, and every fucker in the scene who matters, because you all matter. Every person who goes to a gig or, or buys an album or can be asked, you all matter. We're all part of the same family, seriously. And it sounds like a trite little throw out, but it really ain't. Giz said it earlier on, and I'm saying it now. If you, if you go to a gig, buy a CD, go to the shop, Put out a fucking zine. You all matter. Every single fucking one of you. Cheers to all of you. Thanks, Paul. I appreciate your support. I'll talk to you soon. Defo, my brother. When there you go, huh? Good guy. Good guy. Still um, me what's that? 
he still owes me ten pounds. Yeah. In fact, in fact the in, the, with interest, I'm sure it's more like fifty now. There you go. Hey, thanks for coming on. It was a great show. I really enjoyed it. Um, I'm looking forward to seeing you when you come to the states. Anybody, anybody you want to thank or shout out or anything? Um, okay. Well, I'll say thanks to uh, my friends um, Chris York, Evan Hirsch, um, all the lads in. Jane Stark, or all my brothers, the brethren in Scream, of course. Um, and who else? All the lads in the Destructors, because the Destructors are doing something now as well. Also, I want to say an extra special thanks to Shop for doing the stand-in bass. Poor old Simon, he's got he's having cancer treatment. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of us that are going through this at the moment. Mm -hmm. um yeah we've reached that age haven't we you know it's uh so so our bassist is having cancer treatment so when we've gone out and done shows we've had to get you know guys to fill in phil smith thank you um johnny march he's he's um the son of brian may oh wow is that right no, you, might, you might not get the connection johnny march brian may <laughs> so um just want to say a massive thanks to those people for helping out and um yeah and it, it's it's come to a gig say hello for god's sakes that's what it's for absolutely know? and i will see you soon if you're over in the states then you know come to one of those shows yeah i'll see you all right thanks giz i'll talk to you soon goodbye well, there you have it. Great show. Yeah. Fantastic guest. Great show. But that's the business we're in, like in The Godfather. That's the business we chose. Music and doing great shows. Uh, thanks, everybody. Thanks, Joe Frank. Thanks, Mary. It was good, good to see you. Um, LaRoche, thank you. Uh, it was a great show. Fucking epic. Fucking epic show. Good one. Glad everybody had a good time. You have a good time. I have a better time. You have a crummy time. I'm I'm bummed. You know, yes, Giz was a great guy. Great guest. Um, yeah, Courtney, you'll like this. Give it a listen. It's a good show. You know, we do good shows. Uh, this Wednesday, Youth is on the show. This is going to be another great one. So here we go, kids. Uh, thanks a lot, everybody. Um, everybody okay? Yes. Much love to everyone, Courtney. Thanks a lot. I'll see you soon. Do good things and good things will come to you.